they're really excited uh discovery plus to merge like warner brothers properties like harry potter like friends succession all game of thrones with discovery shows like deadliest catch and worst cooks in america it's like <laughs> the, one of these things is not like the other at all the property brothers come and fix up the weasley yeah. shitty house Ken <laughs> <laughs> kendall roy on cupcake wars yes. yeah oh man uh, welcome to light the camera bar episode 47 of season two jeff d low alongside ken jack chris castellani gooch Coming at you with two movies, two interviews today. We have uh, Bullet Train with Brad Pitt and many other people, an ensemble cast. Uh, also, Prey, the prequel to Predator, uh, which I, I don't even know. If, I mean, I think there's many people who are learning it still exists. Mm -hmm. uh, we'll get into that. That's a, that's a the whole thing. The whole the release of that movie is very bizarre. Should have absolutely yeah. been in theaters. Like you, you really had to be into movies to know that was coming out. <laughs> Um, and then uh, two interviews with the legendary John Ratzenberger from Cheers and every Pixar movie. And then J.J. Perry, a stuntman, awesome interview with him. Gets really some really good. cool insight into the stunt business. He's directing a new movie um, called Day, Day Shift, Shift with uh, Jamie Foxx. In a, in a Dave few Franco. Others. Yeah. A couple of people. Yeah. Very. Yeah. That, that was a he, he gave a couple industry secrets and then one he wouldn't even tell us. Yeah, that's right. I, mean, I want to find it out now. I want to yeah. like reverse engineer or whatever. Like, I can't tell out. you that trick. Yeah. Uh, hmm. So that's that. We have a lot of interviews coming up. Aubrey Plaza next week. Katie mm -hmm. Asselton for those who love The League. Very good one as well. Fans of the show The League on FX. Uh, yes, yeah, so we have those coming up in the future, uh, I believe, next week. Uh, so a lot to get to today. Uh, but first, this episode of Spotlight Camera Bar Show brought to you by Allbirds. Uh, Allbirds, great footwear company we've talked about for a long – even we talked about Allbirds before they were a sponsor. Mm -hmm. uh, made from natural materials, better for you, better for the planet, very comfortable shoes. Uh, like like pillows on your feet. That's what I always say. Uh, premium natural materials, eucalyptus fiber, breathable knit, keeps your feet cool. All of them. Uh, the tree runners, the wool runners, all of them are fantastic shoes. The slip-ons are great. Uh, super lightweight, makes them perfect to pair along on any adventure. I'm wearing them right now. Yeah, look at that. As we speak. You can dress them up, dress them down. You can go out with them. Uh, in the city, too, this disgusting New York City, I walk with them. They don't get that dirty because every shoe gets ruined in New York. Yes. Every yeah. shoe. But these are also super happens. easy to clean. So simple. Yeah, the bottom, you just get a regular old washcloth or paper towel, wipe it off, mm -hmm. good to go. Very versatile. Like we said, you can wear them anywhere you want. Uh, you can run in them. You can you can go somewhere, look nice in them. Uh, they're fantastic. Great colors, too. You can interchange the a little life hack, get the laces. Yeah, that's right. Change the laces, look like you got different shoes. We invented that just now. <laughs> Uh, great travel shoe. Also, they, they they flatten very easily. They do. That's true. They very easy fit, to put away in your luggage. Yeah, like nothing worse when you got to pack shoes in like a suitcase, and it, it like the sneakers take up thirty percent of the suitcase. Yeah. The the Allbirds go flat. Uh, ideal sneaker for spring, winter, summer, all of it. Uh, find your new favorite shoes uh, at Allbirds a l l b i r d s dot com. That's Allbirds dot com. Uh, <clears throat> other than that. Uh, it didn't say anything too overly exciting. I thought I was going to puke when I walked in here today. I haven't eaten any breakfast this morning. <laughs> there was a weird there's, smell in the office. There's there. Chick-fil-A breakfast upstairs. You might have to go oh, there after. Oh, that's what it is. Yeah. I, I, I'm, not, I'm not a fan. Of their breakfast? Yeah. Oh, nah. no. They're, it's not a chicken taste no, in the morning chicken for me. Minis, they're little chicken minis. That's not so a chicken good. taste I like in the morning. I will note oh. that there was a very disappointing story with this and that Smitty told me it was up there. He goes up. It's like, I'll grab you something. He comes back down. I open I gets me the biscuit. I open up the biscuits empty. It's just somebody had taken the meat out of the biscuit that is, and just left the buttered biscuit. That is absolutely just fucked. Just an insane person behavior by I, whoever that was. On I, don't, I don't love their chicken biscuits. That's, a, that's too much chicken. The chicken minis is just their nuggets on the mm -hmm. little like... The, what is it? It's like little honey rolls. Yeah. So yeah. Good. Exactly. That's just not that disrespectful. It, it just doesn't do. It just doesn't do it for me. Mm -hmm. elite I don't. Tailgate I, I, food. Give me a bojack. It is an elite tail. Day. Wait, the breakfast elite mm -hmm. tailgate food. I would. That is such. That's such a niche take. I think that uh, to say no. Chick Fil A is a, is the that, best. That might just be an SEC take, but yeah. Those <laughs> no, I believe that. Minutes. That's that sounds yeah. like an SEC thing. I just can't imagine going to a, ta a tailgate and getting having Chick Fil A fr fr fringe SEC football over there. <laughs> no offense. <laughs> we're, we're good now. Yeah, no, you guys aren't bad. Any, that's that's very Will, true. Will Levis taking us to the promised land, eating <laughs> bananas whole, uh, oh. putting mayo in his coffee. We were just talking. About, Lorenzen's a Kentucky guy, right? Oh, yeah. yeah. Rest yeah. in peace. Oh, yeah. yeah. We were just talking for a long time about Lorenzen, the hefty lefty, the Pillsbury throw boy, Pillsbury throw boy the yeah. absolute goat lefty quarterback ever. It's like him, Michael Vick, Tebow, 
That's the top three lefty quarterbacks of all time. In he, my was, he was the QB during the bluegrass miracle, right? When they <laughs> yes. lost LSU. Mm-hmm. Uh, right? Yes. Yeah, it was oh because that was oh two, right? So yeah, I yeah. think so. Mm-hmm. That was a beast. Those clips, dude, that came out of him and whatever that like uh, semi pro football that was league really was. Sad. Yeah, it was, that was sad. Dude, he was juking people out and running. He looked great. Uh, like functionally. Is, for is is there like it's funny because we're about to talk about Batgirl. We're about to talk about like a canceled mm-hmm. thing. Is there anything sadder though than just really any non NFL football league at this point? Well, yeah. and, and I, you know what? I will nope. I will not include the CFL on that. I know the CFL is obviously massive in Canada. I don't watch CFL, but I know the CFL is very is a very successful football league. Mm-hmm. But I, I mean American minor league football. It is <sighs> routinely shame. like the XFL is going to be sad again. I don't care that the Rock is behind it. It's just gonna be it's gonna be sad. Yeah. I actually hear. Black Adam's success will tell me how good the XFL is going to be. <laughs> They're definitely tied I'm, together. I'm actually not even kidding on that. Like I, I because if if Black Adam like does crazy numbers, mm-hmm. then I'm going to say, you know what, The Rock has the ability to make it like a football league interesting. Yeah. Yeah, uh, I think that like you're right about that. There's definitely a parallel success path between XFL and uh, I mean, there's Black Adam. I mean, I literally root for an NFL team that that is risking taking a guy who's going to get suspended for a year because that's how hard it is to find a quarterback in the NFL. And they're also struggling to keep a running back who got suspended for domestic violence. True. Too, so, but like, there's very few great NFL quarterbacks. How many are there? With 10, 12? Yeah. If yeah. that, and then you have to watch a league where none of them are great. Or even close. They're all mostly horrible. And that's the thing that was a shame about when the UFC, UF, USFL folded when it did, it was on track to be like the the greatest compliment to the NFL. It was in the offseason of the, of the regular NFL. There was good players signing there. And then like I think when Trump became an owner of the commanders or whatever, he's like, no, no, no. The we generals, should, yeah. Yeah, the generals. He's like, we should compete with the NFL, make sure we air at the same time. And immediately folded because everyone was watching the NFL. Where are they going again for the XFL? They, they just announced it. Uh, and okay. that's the other thing, too. They I also think they pick – they picked too many markets with, t- I guess maybe not this, no, nah, sort of this year. Arlington, so Dallas, Houston, Vegas. Mm-hmm. Okay, no. You don't, you don't, you don't, I mean, no. Don't you go don't need a team city. in any of those. Don't go to a city where there's Orlando's teams. fine. There's so many. Or that stadium's dumpy as fuck so in Orlando, bad. by the so way. So bad. Uh, St. Camping, Louis. Camping World Stadium. <laughs> when I went, I went for Penn State LSU back in Citrus, 2000. Citrus Bowl? Uh, it was the Capital One Bowl when I went. Oh, okay. Uh, 2009, 2010 season. Uh, Trendon Holiday was on LSU. Oh hell yeah! Uh, Leveled by Pat McAfee that one time. Navarro Bowman. Oh, that's uh, a great ass player. That was a great. That was a great fuck. Those are those were two teams that probably should have been in a BCS bowl, but had or like mm-hmm. one random early season loss. But the the it was pouring, and the water runoff went into the concession booth, like not to the people waiting in line. Like the concession workers were drenched, just absolutely soaked. Michigan had a big win at the Capitol Bowl over over Tebow, right? It was Lloyd Carr's final game. That was Lloyd Carr's final game. We, we were crazy underdogs. That was Tebow's Heisman year. Capital One Bowl was a bowl where you could like – you weren't in the BCS, but you were close. Yes. You were like, you know what? It this kind of counts. It's the closest it's, one. It's the bowl game you go to if you lose your conference championship game. Yeah. I mean, it was like that was before conference championship games. But like we – that year – that was the App State year. We lost to Appalachian State. Right. Oh, yeah. Dude, did I ever say that? Had, what people for, I was at that game. What people forget about that team is that they had, they were at home against Ohio State last game of the year. If they would have won, they would have gone to the road. Did, did I ever tell you that? Um, I have a buddy that went to App State, and he worked in, like, their gymnasium area. And he went, mm-hmm. there, went there once. And, like, their entire gym is just a mural to that game, the one time they were able to beat Michigan. Yeah. It's so funny. It, it, what's what's cool about that too? I mean, you know, I, I would have preferred we would have won that game, obviously. But what's cool is like they are what they are today because of that game. Mm. Like they actually sustained it. Like they've become like a, a you know a, a relatively like major you know D one program now, and it started like with that game. A Michigan team that was stacked, dude. When you look at who was on that Michigan mm-hmm. team, shouldn't have been within forty points. Manningham, Mike Hart, and um, Chad Henney. Chad Henney. Jake yeah. Jake Long, who was the number one pick. Sean Crable. Like first dude. ever game on the Big Ten Network too. Oh, yeah, wow. great yeah. debut. What a great what way to debut awesome for the debut. Holy what shit. a great way to debut for the Big. <laughs> there was there was a documentary on BTN. I think in 2017. I think it was 10 years after the game, where basically everyone like Dave Revson and the guys who were in the studio were like, "Dude, I can't believe this. This couldn't have gone any better for us." Yeah, I mean, like so what? Like, like there's really no other way to. But yeah, I mean, and the Big Ten Network's been obviously incredible. I mean, successful enough where they're just now sniping teams from the yeah. West Coast. Mm. Why uh, are yeah. three yeah. of the eight? 
XFL teams in Texas. Yeah, so three of them are in Texas. One of them yeah. not in Austin. Three, oh, nearly half. One of them not in Austin, where there is no like you have a big yeah. you have stadiums. You you have the ability to put a team in Austin. They're they're Austin's receiving the MLS very well. Uh, San Antonio is a good one because yeah. when, when they did that AFL, San Antonio they did love that. Uh, that school there, like Alamo Dome, is cool ridiculous. too. What's the what's the uh, they just went D one last year. The university in San Antonio. Well, they UTSA. Were, yeah, they, they were, go, they, they've been D1 yeah. for a while, but football. They were selling out like last year. Their 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 head coach was Larry Coker for a while, the old Miami oh, coach. My, that's right. <laughs> Legend. Heinz Ward is the coach of this team in San Antonio, which is kind of cool. Jim, oh, yeah. Jim Haslin, uh, yeah, Bob Stoops. Bob, Bob, uh, Bob Stoops, yeah. <laughs> I, I love football, but I just don't have an appetite for off-brand, any yeah. off-brand mm. NFL. I, I can barely do – I mean – it's going to sound See, sacrilege, but I can barely do college football. Like, it's like I am just get worn out by the Sunday, Monday, Thursday grind. Mm-hmm. They the, the thing is, and this is, I mean, I don't know. Like, I'm not I'm not a fucking scientist on this. Like, I don't I don't know. But I remember the XFL. My dad worked for Spalding Sports. And so we had XFL balls all over those the house. So those are great balls, They're crazy. Too. But great the logo. XFL was sick because it was fucking stupid. Yeah. That's yeah. why. Now, granted, the ratings went off big time. And they and if yeah. you watch the 30 for 30, there are things that went into it. Vince McMahon kind of strangleholded it a little yeah. too much from Dick Ebersol. But at first, people did watch. And then they made it a little too corny. Like the, the best game that they had the first week that didn't make air because like they had a broadcast yeah. issue. So it had issues. But there was people talked about it. The more they make the XFL not like the fun, wacky shit. I don't know. I just like I don't I don't the, care. Yeah. Don't try to be the NFL. Like whatever you're doing, and we're gonna we're actually gonna kind of talk about this same sort of thing with DC later yeah, on. But like, don't don't try to be what the already successful thing is. Do something different, and people will go to it. You need something unique. So everyone's just gonna wait for regular football, which is significantly better than the product you're putting out. Did Did you guys ever listen to the Opie and Anthony segments where they talked about like their work in the XFL? I have not. No. It was well, Vince McMahon really liked Opie and Anthony. And so he would give them like little bits to do throughout the XFL season. And they were like, dude, we don't know shit about football. And he's like, I don't care. I like you. We think you're funny. We're going to have you do stuff. And that was, that was weird. Cause that was right before they popped too. It was right before like, you know, that they, they became what, you know, this national show. Um, but it's funny to listen to, cause it's just, it, it was clear that league was such a clusterfuck when it first started. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I mean, it, it had potential. It just things, I mean, the, the biggest omen was that they had a, a blimp. That was oh, the yeah. XFL football, and it crashed. The, I love the idea of the, <laughs> the virgin Vince McMahon wanting to get Opie and Anthony, and then the Chad NFL. Oh, we love Frank Caliendo and Rob Riggle. <laughs> yeah. Everyone loves these guys. Yeah, which we do love Rob Riggle. Remember yeah, those? Remember when Frank Caliendo? Remember when the Frank Caliendo at, at Fox NFL Sunday thing was <laughs> yeah. like the that was greatest thing ever? That's oh, when he went no, to when he went to ESPN is when it died. Yeah, because he was OG because of Mad TV. Yep. Well, he was he was the first comedy special I ever owned. By the way, Frank Frank Caliendo. Like he was for like. And I, I love Caliendo, but there was about a two-year stretch, yes. maybe even less, in which he was forced down everyone's throat. He's Joey Molinaro. What's the uh... – <laughs> In well, the nicest way. I don't mean that as an love, insult. That's just on. true. Once the – uh... yeah, yeah, Frank TV, he had – he was just coming off of Mad TV, and then he was on Fox like every yeah. single day. Once he yeah. started doing the Gruden stuff with Gruden, that, yeah. I think that's about when the joke died. Yeah, yeah. I agree with that. There is, there's nothing, and I again, I will reiterate, I do like Caliendo, but there is nothing more, like, old man, like, than him impressing somebody with like a like a impression right oh. now who's never seen it. Yeah, you want to see Christopher Walken? I yeah. got it for you. <laughs> he he is he is he is the best though, and he he's inspired great impressionist. He's inspired years of just horrible impression. The worst. There, my favorite YouTube video is any YouTube video where it's like guy does a hundred impressions yes, in, she, in, in five in minutes, <laughs> and he just does the best. And there's always there's always a run of five Family Guy voices, and too, no matter and what. Always bad. <laughs> yeah, there's always a Stewie. There's always a Peter. There'll yeah. be like three or four like really good ones leading into that section too, and then I'll be like, here's Stewie. Damn you, woman! Yeah, that's like, it's always yeah, yeah. Like, not even close. Yeah. <laughs> the thing I, I would say ninety five percent of impression, and I'm I'm lowballing it. Ninety five percent of impressionists are terrible. Do you guys remember who was like the big impressionist before Caliendo? It was this guy Fred Travelina. Yeah, 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 yeah. And he he sucked ass. He was terrible. <laughs> he would go on the Tonight Show, and I always hate these setups. This was also an Opie and Anthony bit where they ripped him to shreds. Where he would yeah. go on like it's like so I heard a. Uh, I heard Giuliani's running for president. You know what would be crazy? If Jack Nicholson ran for president. You know? <laughs> yeah. yeah. He, would put, he would put on sunglasses and go, that's the number one sign in impression is bad. 
when they, when they say the name of who the guy is. So he goes, hey, I'm Jack Nicholson. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Go fuck yourself. That, that, that's, yeah, any, there's, that is just a, my, one of my favorite, like, stand-up comedy or any type of thing is when they, when they insert their character in situations where it would never work. That's what um, mm-hmm. I just rewatched recently. Uh, Patrice O'Neill ripping oh, that oh. fan on um, yes. Tough Crowd with Colin Quinn, and he's yes. like, "Did you just force your Korean mother into like it was someone with like Osama yeah. bin Laden?" And he goes, like, and they, they, "Yeah, it's I love when they, anyone put their character in situation like why why are they here? Are why is John Madden good? in the Seinfeld apartment right now?" Uh, he openly admitted that like that kind of killed that fan's career. Like, mm. Oh, it fact that destroyed him. Destroyed him. That was like he had, like a, the, tenden- he had a tendency to do that. That was like Jamie Foxx when he crushed that guy on the roast. This is your conscience speaking. This is your conscience. That guy ended speaking. that man's career oh. Oh. on the spot. Maybe I should tell another joke and. <laughs> yeah. <it up>. yeah. <laughs> oh. Um. All right. Movie time. Yeah. Uh. Oh, we'll do it. We got. We have yeah, three ads. Yeah. We got to rip another one. Uh. What not? Uh. If you haven't heard about what not live stream auction app where you can buy collectibles, comics, really anything. We did it here. At Barstool. We auctioned off my lunch boxes. Mm-hmm. Made like five hundred bucks on those lunch. I didn't. The Yak did. One of our shows did. So I still lost money on that. Let's be clear on that. <laughs> uh, but they were they were signed. Uh, what not? They bring businesses and people together through commerce where sellers can host live streams. Uh, you can engage with them as well. Uh, happening 24-7 around the clock. Barstool's on what not to. We are our newest seller on what not. Going live twice a week, running live shows, selling never before auction items. We're actually in the auctioning off all the dozen jerseys. So if you watch the dozen trivia, we're going to auction off. the. We're going to get them signed. We're going to auction them off. Some will be together as teams. But if you want a, a used... Frank the Tank jersey, which that you one was used smell crazy in, in Chicago. In Chicago, two, uh, also two matches in the Dozen Trivia Tournament. We are before the season starts. Season three is going to start in mid end September. We will because we're getting all new jerseys. We have all new logos. Uh, funny enough, we just released the Smokin logo. Yeah, that's right. A nice little bit of irony or coincidence. Uh, so we're going to be uh, auctioning those off. So you can go on whatnot, and uh, if you're interested in having a a signed a signed Ken Jack Smokin yeah. jersey. Get that maybe we'll. That's actually the only way to get that. We don't sell the here too. No, we don't sell the smocking thing either. We don't sell the smocking shirt. That's Trill's thing. We'll never sell that. So if you want a smocking thing, that's the way to get it. That's the way to get the Ken Jack one. I should give you. I have a smocking TC shirt too. I should give you that. We can throw it in. Yeah, we can. We can throw it in. Uh, yeah. So check that out. Download a whatnot. W A T. W H A T N O T app and follow the Barstool Sports account at Barstool Sports. You'll be the first to get notified when you go live. We're going to do that in the fall. Use the link in the description. Get $10 off your first purchase. When you buy the Ken Jack jersey for five grand, exactly, it'll be yeah. $4,900. Are, are they all going to be used? What do you mean? Like, are they all used jerseys? Game used jerseys? So, no, you can get like, no, uh, most of them are. That's wow. better, I think. Yeah. Most of them are. Who do you think is going to be the. The most expensive Franks. Franks. Dave. Pro- I, I'm sure we could fetch a lot for a Dave Portnoy used signed anything. Or Tommy's, actually. Tommy. The I'm M- sure Tommy could ra- rile up. Some people will buy the Frank the Tank one. <laughs> yeah. Casey Smith. <laughs> oh, God damn it. There are some unused. Right. Yep. There is uh, Four Play, our golf podcast, for those who don't know. They they had jurors. They didn't make the tournament. Assigned Frankie Borelli. Mm-hmm. Assigned Riggsy. But Nick, Nick <laughs> Nick's our good friend all, Nick yeah. Terrain, st- uh, took that for himself. <laughs> he owns that jersey. So yeah, we're going to be doing that on Whatnot, so, so keep an eye out for that. I'll sign Big Cat since I own him anyway. Scott, so. uh, yeah. about, do you have a Rig Scottsdale Little Franks? <laughs> yeah, his, my, his minor league trivia team. Yeah. <laughs> um, all right. Here we go. Movie news. The big one off the top is the Batgirl news. Um, Batgirl was canceled. So DC, yeah. Discovery bought DC. Right. Uh, not bought uh, Warner Brothers. Yes. Or is it, was it a bought, bought or a merger? They bought Warner they bought, Brothers, they bought they bought Warner Brothers from, from AT and T. Right. So they yeah. bought and it, but they they it's a it's a buy slash name merger. Yeah. Yes. Um. You got to talk about David Soslov. This guy's the fucking goat. He's yeah. He is an incredible human being. This quotes from before this merger. He's the CEO of Discovery, which bought and merged with Warner Brothers, and he became then the CEO of HBO. Um, he's, when he was asked about scripted drama, he said, scripted drama, please. It's like watching a kid's soccer game. Everyone saw something that worked and started chasing the ball. It's just way too expensive. It, 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 Why would you buy HBO? Why would you want to be the CEO of HBO? Everything coming out of this thing is, it's one of those things for me where I'm always you, you you look at announcements and, and we'll read the slide that HBO Ma- that they released about HBO Max and Discovery Plus after we talk Batgirl. You look at these things and you go, 
No, they're smarter than me. Mm-hmm. They're they're smarter than me. Yes. There's there's no way there's no way what they're no. saying is really this dumb. But in in a year we're gonna be like these people were fucking stupid. Mm-hmm. And actually there is a quote about Kevin Feige that confirms I know they're stupid. But yeah, so Batgirl was canceled. Um, Batgirl had been it essentially was, completed. It's yeah. it's done. It just needs like you know the ten fifteen million dollars yeah. worth of post production uh, and marketing effects. would be more for it, sure. Yeah, it still. was directed by Adil El Arbi and Bilal Fala, who did the it Bad Boys reboot. Marvel. Uh, and Bad they Boys on Miss Marvel and yeah. Miss Marvel. Bad Boys was very well received. Yeah. We yeah. love Bad Boys. A blast. Um, the fact that it was not just like a decent movie, but also fun was like it was like the yeah. be- remember it was like because it came out before the pandemic, right? Right before the pandemic. It was like right. the best movie. Re- remember, people joked like, "Is Bad Boys for Life?" He nominated for best picture. Yeah, that's never right. Yeah. Movie. Yep. But it was it was like even if you didn't think it was great, like it was a fun movie. Fun. And those types of movies are not typically fun these days. Mm-hmm. So they got the job. A lot of people in the movie. Leslie Grace got cast uh, as Barbara Gordon, Batgirl. Uh, She's great. I mean, Fraser. She was in, in Worth the noting. People yeah. said it. A Latina in the role it was a big deal. People were amped about it. Also, J.K. Simmons, James Gordon. Yes. Uh, and, he was uh, back he, in that role. Yeah. yeah. Brendan Fraser. Yes. The King is Firefly. 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 Um, we had our man in the movie as the villain. We had two of our men in the movie already. Michael Keaton <laughs> back as fucking Batman. Yeah. Uh, this was going to get released on HBO Max, right? They, was, I think they were they hadn't made the decision yet, but it was yeah. leaning that way. But it was for a while because originally the H, this was originally a Joss Whedon project. Yeah. Um, so yeah, this, this weird weird fucking passion project to have. He was obsessed with that. It, it, oh, it, really? it checks out. He wanted to. Uh, yeah. Really? Is it that? Is it that weird? Yeah. That, it yeah. seems like it's on the right yeah. well, track. That, that was yeah. the first. I think that was the first indicator that he's a weirdo. Like, <laughs> yeah. He's wow. obsessed with Batgirl. Uh, yeah. So yeah. So the, I mean, there was talks about maybe. Uh, I mean, th- yeah, this, this, she was going to be integrated in other movies. This would be a whole thing. It was completed for the most part, basically done. Yeah. Uh, it cost 90 million to make. That's a decent sized budget for what yeah. could be streaming, could not be. They canceled it. Uh, Discovery yeah. swoops in, they cancel it. Uh, apparently it's a 15 to $20 million tax write off for Warner Bros. So they, they do, they do save. A fourth and they of the don't budget. Also, have to spend the additional money on marketing, correct? Too, so, which, I mean, do, I, like, I don't know. Do they just toss it on streaming at that? I, mean, I don't know. I guess I don't know. They that, can save money, but my question was, and I don't think we really got it answered, was like, how much more are they spending to this point to release it, and how much to finish it? I don't know. But I think what they said was like, but they're saving. What money. Zaslav said, anyways, like, we don't want to release any movie we don't believe in, which is good because DC I, makes I, so I many movies they that. should not. I, have I do in. agree with that. I think that more studios need to. Yeah, <laughs> but they, that. but like, and they also said they didn't see any economic reward in dumping it onto HBO Max. So like, if there's no reward for them there, and they're gonna have to spend all this extra money in post and also on marketing and also on everything else, like, if you want to save that plus make more money off a tax write off economically. If you don't, if you think this movie is shit, sure, I guess it makes sense. Uh, now people are saying that it has the same test screening scores as Black Adam, as Shazam: Fury of the Gods. That's not a great sign either. Uh, like, that's, 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 that's not a good. I don't know what. Anything. I don't know what the sign. That's a bad sign, one way or the other, yeah. in some way. Uh, people said, of course, they're going. You know, said like, oh, they're they're going full steam ahead with Joker too, but they can't mm-hmm. release something that's different. Uh, so people were very up in arms. This is it is fucking insane. It is nuts, and it is unprecedented. Like it's very, really very this is this is not a th- normal thing. It it's shitty. Uh, it sucks to have. First of all, all those names, and it's not. This is not like this is like uh, like some dumpy C movie or something. Some yeah. some stupid like offshoot thing. No one's heard of, but nobody's in it. Like it's like a CW well, show. Which yeah, canceled well, apparently Batgirl is just the most obscure Mar- DC character of all time, yeah. according to our coworkers who. Didn't know Batgirl was a real character. Yes, that, that is true. Yeah. 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 Also, not that crazy. Like, I don't know. Like, it's I don't know. I Batman's like that... the most famous superhero on earth, like other than Superman. Like, the Batgirl is not that off off from like one of the or that far detached from one of the greatest. Batgirl was in a fucking Batman movie already. Yeah. Yes. Shout out to uh, Alicia, uh, Silverstone. Alicia Silverstone. Alicia Silverstone. Yeah. yeah, that's right. And she was gonna be in another. Remember? Uh, what oh was yeah. It? Uh, yeah, that's right. Adam Malone, right? You know, they never put nipples on her suit. That's fucked up. That's actually very sexist. <laughs> it was very sexist. Uh, so yeah, the whole thing is fucked up. Um, some of it still doesn't make a ton of sense to me Mm -hmm. as the timing it's again, it's canceled, but there's a bit of irony because now everyone wants to see it. Yeah. (laughs) So I don't know. No one gave a fuck about it before. Yeah. People are just now acting to be fair. They care about it. I think it's fucked up. I don't think they should have done it. I feel really bad for everybody involved. 
I understand what they're saying. I don't agree yeah. with it because we watch so much nonsense trash that's released, yeah. and you know they're going to have awful, stupid, shitty ideas they're still going to run with. And then what made it even worse was this came out before their keynote speak, their their, their earnings call where they presented about the future of mm-hmm. Warner Brothers yeah. Discovery, and it made this decision look just even worse because the things they said were so fucking stupid yes. that you're just like, yeah. what the fuck? Like, if, if this had been, and this sounds crazy, to, and I don't think this would have happened, and for what it's worth, Kevin Feige notedly has fought for a lot of people in the MCU. He fought yeah. against Bob Chapek, the Disney mm-hmm. CEO who fil- who replaced Bob Iger, who apparently Bob Iger doesn't like yeah. and regrets <laughs> letting him secede yes, him. I mean, he came out of retirement. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So he, uh, Kevin Feige fought for Scarlett Johansson and all that. So like, I'm not saying Kevin Feige would have done this. However, if Kevin Feige and Marvel would have made this decision, I don't think people would have, people would have been angry, but there would have been a little they more trust. trust. Kevin Feige. Yeah. Right. There's yeah. no trust. Like, yeah. you've you've not Nothing done anything. And I know decisions. this is Discovery coming in and doing it, so it's mm-hmm. not like they've made DC decisions before. But the problem is you're associated with the brand, so people aren't going to give you the benefit of the doubt anyway. Uh, so HBO Max, they then said, was maybe going to go away, which people were like, what the fuck? Yeah, the rumors that were flying, and they were coming from, like, reputable sources, were, like, 70% of HBO Max's development staff were just out the door. Yeah, like, which is crazy. Max is going to die. And that was like legit sourcing on that. And mm-hmm. then it turned out that they were wrong. Thank God. I think that was yeah. probably the best piece of news that came out from that meeting was like, oh, no, nobody's getting fired yet. Noted yeah. the best streaming service in terms of library. Not even well, with I think content library. library. Their original stuff, like we were talking about this the other day, like their original programming is like kind of so-so. And they removed a lot of HBO Max released movies. They removed Super Intelligence, The Witches, oh, uh, American, American Pickle, Pickle, Lockdown, that <laughs> terrible COVID movie, Moonshot. And they removed it because like you can essentially write off the life of the movie on your streaming service, like how much you would have made. So they're just like, fuck it, we're not going to keep it in our library if it's not going to, if we can get a tax break for it and no one's watching it anyway. So I get that. Like when you're moving, you're cutting off that sort of cancer from your your streaming service. But when you have something that's like as hyped up as a DC property, I feel like how much more, you get some goodwill just like working with comic book that's, movie fans. You know what I mean? Like that's, that's what, what I think. Thing. I think it's like one of those decisions that's like smart today, like economically smart, yeah. but it's dumb tomorrow because you're burning bridges. You're souring world. your base. You're burning yeah. your bridges. And especially with him for this guy, Zaslav, like you're coming in with Discovery Plus and everyone's afraid of you doing this exact thing and you do it. And like when your entire base of like your CEO, like your business mind is like, hey, I want to make super cheap reality TV that gets a big budget return. Like everyone is going to think you're going to do this and you do it anyway, that's insane to me. Like you need to do things to like prove to people that you're going to be an ally to HBO viewers or viewers or, or fans in general. Yeah. So uh, Discovery Plus will fold in the HBO Max. Discovery Plus is a lot of channels. Uh, Food Network. Yeah. Um, HGTV. Property Brothers. TLC. TLC fucking yeah. Brothers. Uh, Discovery Plus is the thing that that plays most in my shore house because I live with Glenny Balls and he watches mm-hmm. um, uh, Diners, Drives and Dives on loop. Yeah. So that so I, I am a big Discovery Plus Good user background. in my household. Good but here's on TV. here's what they say. This this is what they this is what they tossed out. So so let's oh, say hypothetically you're like, okay, you know what? I trust them on Batgirl. I trust them there. They then fucking show this slide in their deck, yeah, right? So Whatever it was. Yeah. It says unique and complimentary, HBO Max and Discovery Plus. HBO Max, male skew. I don't really but I don't rock. I don't I don't buy that. I don't off the top. I, don't buy that. I They're currently airing F Boy Island. When when okay. I when I watched through the entire Gossip Girl reboot in two weekends, I knew that was a dude rock oh, dude yeah. rock moment for me. <laughs> like, I don't agree with that whatsoever. Scripted. Okay, that's that's yeah. Fair. Again, though, even yeah. though one of the shows we're promoting very heavily right now, isn't it? Isn't F Boy Island on HBO Max? It My, is for yeah, sure on right? HBO Max. Yeah. Uh, lean in. I don't really, I don't know what that means. I didn't listen to the call, so I don't. Yeah, I, I don't get that either. That's maybe a, maybe that means that's more a business. Term. I, I would assume that yeah. means more like invest. You need Eric in, to- <laughs> invest into the content harder. I guess. I guess so. Okay. Uh, appointment viewing, sure. Yes. HBO home of fandoms. Yeah, I feel like yeah. that's like the most important thing. Those are okay. because if you have like a fan base, like fandoms like they actually spend money on like other seems stuff. a little a little contradictory of canceling one of your DC projects. Yes. But okay, Discovery Plus female skew. I guess like there are okay. definitely female channels, but there's a lot of non-female stuff yeah. on there. A lot of it, a lot of stuff that you would assume is a male demo. Like yeah. most, like women watch the Food Network, but a lot of the Food Network shows are are very male skew. The Discovery stuff, like there's a lot of male skew on there. Unscripted, okay, yes, that's that's true. I guess 
It is. Lean back. So that's more like background stuff. Okay. You know, maybe don't invest as hard as HBO Max. Comfort viewing home of genre dumbs. What uh, does that fucking mean? Yeah. Yeah. I, which I don't I don't particularly know what that means. A word. I, love, I love when business people just invent yeah. words. <laughs> so then they then they had another slide, which this is this is the slide everyone fucking loved. Um, oh, oh, they also so they had a slide of course correction measures initiated. Shut down of CNN Plus. Great move. Yep. Awesome. Who the yeah. fuck? No CNN, one's get the fuck out of here. up CNN. for one day. Yeah. One Bro- day. It is. They are going to. They said they're going to put the uh, the like uh, what's the decades series that CNN did. That was actually really good. Yeah. And they're putting that on HBO Max. So I'm kind of happy. about. I, it. I'm sad they're going to they're not going to have the this is this is there are two people gets the Brian Stelter cinematic universe on CNN plus mm-hmm. uh, restructuring of content portfolio for scripted linear kids and animation direct to HBO Max films international more balanced approach to extend content licensing while protecting certain key properties implementing an HBO Max distribution strategy aimed at wider availability versus retail only greater accountability alignment and communication across okay that's just it's all it's corporate it's business What's the other one then the uh then they released the, yeah, the big slide yes. the global powerhouse slide yes. brands HBO discovery CNN HGTV CA uh Cartoon Network DC and Looney Tunes mm-hmm. okay that, that's what yes they have big brands franchises this then this this is the this tab is so great. Uh, i'm gonna go back to franchise because it's the best one uh hbo max and discovery iconic series and characters friends fixer upper the big bang theory property brothers diners drive-ins and dives and sex in the city I, I would argue both mo- a lot of that is, is male skew by the way yeah just to, just like and a few of them female skew as well international they have a bunch of other things which that's not as applicable to us right now franchises Batman, Wonder Woman, Superman. Okay. Hey, Fair. what's that first one? Batman. You might yeah. think you want to protect that. Yeah. It's, it, do you? Do you? Are you sure you like Superman? Uh, Shark Week. Oh yeah, just like, <laughs> like right on the same line as is all Shark the DC Week, superheroes. I've always wanted this. Is Shark Week like? that big because it's only one i don't think so year. people go nuts about it though they like, do it, but i feel like i think people watch they saw step brothers yes and yeah. yes right i don't it's, think it's don't that think, big i don't think anyone actually okay well some people do i don't think that many people watch shark Week. no i think it's just a, it's because of step brothers it's a meme thing it's like yeah right it's like fucking morbius like we <laughs> talk about i i agree about it, i think it's more actually, meme. i don't i've never met a yeah, I've never met a single person who says, "Dude, I can't wait for Shark Week this year." Yeah, I, I, I just I, I think it's more of a meme thing. But I don't know. Maybe, maybe I'm sure for their network, it's big. Yeah, but I don't. I don't. It, yeah. Well, was it during Shark Week, like five years ago, when they put out that mermaid, doc, the fake mermaid documentary? <laughs> yeah. Do you remember <laughs> that? I don't remember that. <laughs> oh, that one, that one had people on Twitter convinced that mermaids were real. <laughs> um, Game of Thrones, which I would argue should be listed first. It's the one they care about easily the most. Yep. Yes. At least HBO does. We'll see if Discovery agrees as well. Uh, 90 Day Fiance Universe. This is the uh, one that got people yes. going. Well, uh, universe. To be fair. There, there is a universe. There like 50 is. different shows. There is. Ken Jack and I, yes. we both watched the show. Uh, there's like the other, 90 days the other way. 90 days the other 90, way. There's 90 days. Before the 90 days. Before the 90 days. After there's like a million different shows. 90, 90, 90 days. days fiance. They, Secret I mean, Wars. <laughs> Secret Wars. I would love to watch that. The, the Kang Dynasty. Have like it, fucking it, Big Ed fighting like one of those like weirdo dudes that like gets girls from the Philippines on a website. Like, yeah. They get these guys fighting. But yeah. I'm not convinced they didn't see the memes of when Kevin Feige was at yeah. Comic Con and they were like, remember people yes, were the Frasier, like the Frasier verse. Frasier like, verse. Yeah, like, I feel like, Park time <laughs> I feel like Discovery, like the Discovery people saw this and they're like, oh shit. Let's call it the 90 Day Fiance. Like, they're serious about this. They have. Um, I want to find all the, I want to find the full list my, of my favorite thing is, uh, there's a quote from Washington post when I was reading about the merger where they're like, that- they're really excited, uh, discovery plus to merge like Warner brothers properties, like Harry Potter, like friends, succession, all game of Thrones with discovery shows like deadliest catch and worst cooks in America. <laughs> it's like the- one of these things is not like the other at all. The property brothers come and fix up the Weasley yeah. shitty house. Ken- <laughs> Ken- <laughs> Kendall Roy on cupcake wars. Yes. Yeah. Oh man. Uh, Kevin. So they have 90 Day Fiance, 90 Day Fiance, Happily Ever After, 90 Day Fiance, Before the 90 Days, Yep. Uh, 90 Day Fiance, What Now, 90 Day Fiance, The Other Way, uh, 90 Day Fiance, Pillow Talk, 90 Day Fiance, Pillow Just talk. Landed, 90 Day Fiance, Self-Quarantine, that started in COVID, 90 Day Fiance, B90 Strikes Back, 90 Day Fiance, Darcy and Stacy, that was a spinoff, uh, 90 Day Fiance, Happy Lever, Happily Ever After, Alumni Strikes Back, 90 Day Fiance, Bears All, 90 Day Fiance, Diaries, I mean, if that's not a universe. 90 Day Fiance, the other way strikes back. 
90 Day Fiance Journey, 90 Day Fiance The Single Life, and then 90 Day Fiance The Single Life. Wait, on, this is the best one. This reminds me of if you ever did, <laughs> if you ever did um, Adult Swim, uh, it is the um, fuck. I always forget it. Um, oh, fuck. It's it's this. It was a commercial during. The show Children's Hospital, which is a mm-hmm. fucking great show. Uh, NTSF SD SUV National Terrorism Strike Force San Diego Sport Utility Sport Utility Vehicle, which was a spinoff on all like all the CSI ones. And this one is li- literally 90 day colon the single life colon pillow talk. Hell yeah. It's like they're just they're just tacking them all on. So to their credit, there is a 90 day fiance universe. That, I mean, that's more stars than exist in the sky. Do they, do they have like their own like Kevin Feige that's just overseeing there all this? Be. And oh, then mean, the Wizarding World Harry Potter of Harry Potter. I wonder if the guy, it has to be like a guy who's just really searching for love. He needs to understand like, <laughs> the these Kevin, people more than anyone. Yeah, who is who? The, yeah, the Kevin Feige. I mean, I guess oh, it would be the TLC, days. the head of TLC. Is that who it would be? Uh, there, is there a showrunner that's responsible for Mike Sh- Matt Sharp? He's the producer of all the ninety day shows. All right, so I guess he's the guy, Matt Sharp. Matt Sharp is the Kevin Feige. In that. So anyway, point being, and okay, so it can, I'm not even done yet. So then it continues. Uh, during the earnings call, human. So they, they highlighted everything. Look at Matt Sharp. What a ridiculous looking human. The Kevin Feige of, of TLC. Okay, so then, so people were like, the male skew, female skew thing threw people off. Like, what the fuck is it even, what? Oh, like, wait, this is a guy in Weezer, different guy named Matt Sharp. Never oh, mind. that's like yeah. the Weezer <laughs> head man. <laughs> They're, they're uh, missing a key demographic. Us fin boys, we we stick to Peacock. Yes, so, that, exactly. so then Zaslav, the Warner Brothers uh, president, he said the big one. This is the one where I knew he had. He has no fucking idea what he's doing. He said they have a ten year plan for DC films. They don't want to put on any films that aren't up to quality. That's fine. Yeah, good, good. And then he said, <laughs> he said. I mean, this is like. It's the it's the world's biggest no fucking shit I've ever like. If you present this as a plan, would you not just be fired? Yeah. Like if if I if today we walked into our CEO's office, Erica, or walked into Dave's office, and he said, "We have a plan for for Lights Camera Barstool. We want to be as big as Pardon My Take." I, I would hope they'd fire us. I see Big Cat as an inspiration. <laughs> yeah, I'm inspired by I'm inspired by Big Cat and PFT and the number and a top three podcast in the world. He said Kevin Feige and Disney they're an inspiration for what we want to do. It's like uh, the Hot Pockets bit from Jim Gaffigan. Like literally that that exact it's business like, meeting. What? Like I, I, I tweeted it out like from the LCB account. Yeah. I was like, this is the equivalent of me being like me, the person who runs this Twitter account, saying like, I want to be a professional basketball player, and I see LeBron James yes, as, as, as an, as an inspiration. inspiration. It's like, uh, yeah, no shit. It's it's just I I the guy who's doing what you do significantly better. Yeah, and I, I'll just say it too is I don't I don't. I hate listening and watching these types of things and thinking I know better because I definitely don't 99% of the time. But this thing, just, this just reeks of like Quibi and stuff like mm-hmm. that where you watch it and you listen to it and you see everything. And you're like, how? How are they going up there and this is their big fucking plan? Mm-hmm. Like, like, th- like there's no way. This just reeks of everything that always fails for these companies. Yeah. Did you see oh, some- oh, I, I got to throw my you know two cents in here. Isn't – at the same time, what's the one thing we've been complaining about with DC forever? There's no plan. There's no plan. They yeah. have no idea what they're doing. I mean, and there's a way. In a way, I kind of respect this just because, like, finally, now that they're kind of trying to clean up whatever is the remnants, the dingleberries that are left over from the Snyderverse, like, I kind of respect the fact that he's openly admitting, like, yeah, we're essentially going to start over. I guess my issue that. is, and I know this is not DC fandom or Comic Con. I, I don't know, like. Give me something more than that. Yeah. yeah. Give me give me something more okay. than right. Like that's my thing. It's like you come in, you cancel a bunch of bunch of shit. You don't alienate Remove people, but you you almost do. You kind of irritate mm-hmm. some people, and you're like, this is what we're gonna do. It's like, yeah. Okay, well they've been doing this for fucking how many years now? I know. Fourteen like, I years. Say, they, almost... They've definitely said this before. Right. This is deja vu where oh, they've said yeah. they're gonna they have a new. Plan. I think like it's you... just like. I'm happy they have a plan, but I don't think they actually have a if plan. If you come in with something like this, to say something like this, right? I think you need to come in and be like, hey, we're getting this person to run DC from now on. We're getting like this person to storyboard it. We're going to have all of these sort of people that have, uh, like I say, resumes like working for Marvel or any other sort of like scripted or like something. Anything that requires cohesion. And you'd say like we have these proven minds that are going to work on DC and get this universe started off and get it back into like the running in competition versus Marvel. That would excite me more than just saying like, yeah, we're gonna try and do we're gonna try and do what Marvel does. We're like, gonna yeah. try to do the DC we know. Yeah. I was kind of surprised they didn't say like we're gonna go all in on director driven projects because that yeah. 
worked for them. That's I their mean, best yeah. movies. It's been working critically and financially, it this, seems like. So like I'm surprised they didn't go up there even, and just like, yeah, we're just gonna start giving directors projects. Even if they just said like we're not even going we'll do to do two a year. If we're if they even said like we're not even gonna attempt to do the DCEU again, we're just gonna keep doing like one off projects like the Batman or like Joker, we're gonna or like whatever. We're gonna let uh, all these things like exist in their own thing. I would actually think that's better than attempting to replicate Marvel because they can't at this point. There's so much ground to cover to try and like catch up with that shared universe. Just do what you're doing that works. Do the spinoffs because Marvel can't do that. They Every time they try to do it, it sucks anyway. Just do it your own way. And like, I think that works. Do the, do yeah. what works. I, I think it, I, I, I think it was in some air. It just, it was so muddied. I don't know. I, I just, yeah, I think I, people are really confused by it. I, I will say that them, them the, trying the to, stuff. right. It's like you come in, you cancel Batgirl, which was interconnected. You say you want to, uh, be Marvel, which is all, which is very interconnected. And then um, you're canceling the one that was interconnected, but then you're, you're like, hey, the Joker 2, which is connected to nothing. Yeah. Which I am excited for Joker 2. Like, I don't like yeah, that I'm it kind of caught. Excited. I don't like that it caught Shrapnel in this, which I get why, because there, there was a lot of like, you're canceling this female lead project and then you're pushing forward. But this is this thing with Joker the Joker. Joker is very unique, though. Yeah. Yeah. And it's going to be a musical with Lady Cop. I mean, like, yeah. that's, that's, I, that's cool. the good stuff for them. Yeah. yeah right. Like, I don't like that cool. it got shit because I yeah. think they're doing. They're doing good shit with that, like the side stuff. Exactly. Like I think Shazam, yeah, it's interconnected, but Shazam is different. It's it's like yeah. people like that. Like so that is my I, – I don't know. Maybe they'll have something good, but it's like, okay, can we just like say something with substance for once? Yeah. I think though, especially right now at this point where with Marvel's at, like they're not like they're like in a little bit of a slump, like a little tiny bit of yeah. a slump. Yes. Like this would be the time you could catch up yeah. and make some ground. Do I think just do stuff that's different. Do those more of those individual products. Give guys like Matt Reeves like more room to run. Give get like other directors that are doing stuff that are di that's different from Marvel. The well that just happened bullshit. Like and you can really like, get the fan base over it. Like yeah. Peacemaker, yeah, exactly. Which James Gunn by the way said is completely safe. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Safe, regime. Safe. Actually, just, Idris Elba just said this morning that yeah. he's got a massive project with DC coming up. They yeah. they have this this. I really want I really want Bloodsport in the next Peacemaker season. I think it'd be yes. awesome to see yeah. him there. Yeah, there's you had this massive window where I mean I haven't loved the Marvel shows, like I they haven't been great. I even I really enjoyed Love and Thunder and Doctor Strange, but they weren't up to the standard for me of what I think the Marvel can do at their best. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, and I all but then here you go in September they just picked up a little steam again. With the San Diego Comic Con September, they're going to have massive news at D twenty three. That is starting to really build up. That the reveals at D twenty three are going to be fucking gigantic. If they go out there and they roll out an awesome, fantastic forecast, yeah. and then Black Panther, which I really think Black Panther is going to be good. And if Black Panther, yeah. kill, and you know, even if it's not amazing, it's going to be another mm -hmm. cultural moment. It's going to have a huge impact on the box office, and it's going to be a big deal pop culture wise. You had this big window, and I you didn't take advantage of it. One of the funny things from Zaslav I was reading too is he's like in the same breath of saying like yeah we don't believe in Batgirl he's like yeah I'm actually like super pumped up for the Flash like I'm that's my most excited project from DC <laughs> and fucking me, while Ezra Miller is getting arrested for like the 80th time I, I will say I I the, all the I, I been think good, the yeah. Flash is gonna be a really fucking good I, I think it has to be because I I think there's no other way it would still be I think the word the word well, from the screenings and like everything is like. DC has a shit ton of faith in this movie, and I think it's going to reset somehow. Mm. I think it gets yeah. Ezra Miller out of the way. I think they'll probably pivot to Wally West. He just gets shot like in the face and yeah. dies. Yeah, after I mean, like ten minutes. It runs into the Speed <laughs> Force and just disappears uh, forever. However, they did already spend like two hundred million on the Flash, yeah. which is like you can't and you can't cancel that. They're, they're reshooting again. I think they're taking Michael Keaton out. Yeah. I think Keaton. Michael. I think they're taking Keaton out of every project that they're yeah. they're going to put him in. Which is uh, well, yeah, because he he was supposed to be in Batgirl. Yeah. yeah. Uh, no, he was supposed to be in something else that they yeah. replaced with. Oh, Aquaman two. Yeah. 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 He was apparently in Aquaman two, and they apparently replaced him with Ben Affleck. Mm -hmm. Apparently, that's a bummer. Why would they put him in Aquaman two? It doesn't make any sense. Why? Mm -hmm. Well, in what? How? Because it connects back to the Flash. And Wayne, you look Walter. different. I don't know. No, it's yeah. me, the same Wayne from the other movies. I'm just older yeah. now. Yeah. yeah. So I think they're bringing Affleck back for the Flash now. Yeah, but I, I, I don't know. They, they just they say they have a plan, but it really it's like it just doesn't. Anyway, they're they're, they're yeah. There's our rant. It just it's one of those. I I could have we really could have summed it up in like, it's like we want to interconnect. Cancels interconnect. Hypes up Joker. It's just it's just one of those like. I don't know if you have. I don't know if you have the plan you think you have. <laughs> still, they still have in greenlit DC Legacy Super Pets too, despite the yeah. incredible post credit. <laughs> I just don't. SP. I, I just, wasp. I you know wasp. you know you know there was a post credit. I know. Yeah, I, I saw. I saw it. I, it. I saw it. I, it was. It was. I actually missed it because I was like, "There's no fucking way they're gonna have a post credit <laughs> for this anime." It was. Um. Movie. It was enjoyable. 
I don't. I mean, I'm sorry if you wanted us to review on review it on here. We're not going to. It was it was a fun animated movie. I I went into it and I saw someone say like, "Oh man, don't you just love when the animated superhero movies surprise you?" And it was like, it was it was it was two photos on Twitter. One was Spider Verse and one was Super Pets. I'm like, <laughs> yeah, yeah, all right. That's just I go this 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 here. might be. And I'm like, all right, that was fun. It wasn't like, I mean, Spider Verse yeah. didn't have a Sturgill Simpson needle drop. Uh, so <laughs> okay, <laughs> wasn't it wasn't earth shattering. <laughs> Um. <laughs> anyway, uh, that is um, Warner Brothers. That is Warner Brothers. The Three other blocks. news: um, remake of Roadhouse starring Jake Gyllenhaal, Billy Magnuson, and Connor McGregor. Connor McGregor in yeah. development. That's cool. I mean, Roadhouse is, the, is like a movie. There's a lot of '80s movie like movies like that that I don't think should be remade because they're like really good. But this is a cheesy enough one where I'm like, yeah, sure, like go for it, do something different. And Connor McGregor, I feel like if you look at him as a persona. He is endlessly entertaining. Like, you may as well have him do stuff like this. And I think it's technically his second acting role, if you consider his role in, was it, Call of Duty Infinite Warfare, where he had a non-speaking role next to Kit Harrington, which was very funny. Uh, but yeah, I don't know. I'm down for this. Yeah, I don't, I'm not, like, offended by it. But you're right. There are just, there are some certain things that live in the world of the 80s or maybe even early 90s for some things. Yeah. And you're like, eh, remake them that many years later. Like, is, is it going to translate? Is the charm going to be there? Because some things just look better I, from that era. I, I mm -hmm. trust Jake G. I think we said I said this yeah. on a long take. I was like, Jake G really like even like ambulance with Mike with like a Michael Bay movie. Like, yeah, it was one of Michael Bay's yeah. best movies. I mean, Jake G picks pretty good stuff almost all the time, every single time. Since Prince uh, of Persia, yeah, he's yeah, really since Prince missed. of Persia. Like it's yeah. It's like even if it's not good, it's interesting. Uh, um first trailer for the Banshees of uh In a Sheeran. In a Sheeran? Banshees of In a Sheeran. Yeah. Really much. Uh, Martin McDonough. Um, releases in October. Colin Farrell, Brendan Gleeson, uh, Barry Keegan. Uh, I mean, if, at this point, if you like Martin McDonough, you just trust that he's going to release a fucking great movie. In Bruges prequel. Yeah, I mean, I I, I never... I, I, I know people hated fucking Three Billboards like in the end. Like, pe everyone loved it. It got the Oscar, but then everyone started shitting on it. I, I always... I think it's a good movie. I yeah, always enjoyed Three I Billboards is great. Billboards. Yeah. Uh, do, do people not like that movie? It, it just... It was one of the movies that... soured on it. Yeah. It soured quick during the Oscar season. Uh, yeah. Like, it just... It was, it was in the cultural award season lexicon too long. Yeah. And it, it is divisive enough, you know, just due to some characters and things. Uh, Seven Psychopaths, I never... I like hated. it. I like that. Yeah, it I wasn't love, his best. I love Seven Psycho. Really, actually. really funny. It's, I thought it's, it's then, a Tarantino ripoff, but it's great. It's definitely a Tarantino. That's a great point. It is a Tarantino yeah. ripoff movie, but it is very funny. And then yeah, In yeah. Bruges is just In Bruges is one of the goats. It's fantastic. One of the best dark comedies ever. And this is the same duo. It's Colin Farrell and Brendan Gleeson. So yeah, it's a, it seems like a real dudes rock extravaganza. It looks like it's gonna be like the most Irish movie. Oh yeah, <laughs> ever. That guy's like a fiddle player. Like what are we? Yeah. Oh yeah, this is gonna be good shit. Uh, um, Lady Gaga officially in Joker too. We knew that. Yeah, they still haven't announced who she's gonna be though. I'm surprised. I'm surprised they. It's gotta be. It's uh, gotta be Harley, but yeah, you almost think they would have said it. It's bad, it's bad girl. Yeah, and yeah. The, that's <laughs> why they canceled it. Yeah, awkward uh, yeah. woman. And Nicole Kidman back on for another year with AMC. Hell yeah, boy! What 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 memes and social media <laughs> will do for a campaign? I mean, it's worked. My favorite thing was like people were saying, "Yeah, she this is unscripted. She didn't even when she was making that thing. Like they didn't even give her a script. She did it all in, uh, right off the cuff for free. Couldn't believe anything less. Yeah." I fucking egg I hate it, but I love it because it always is right after the preview or like their AMC pre-roll thing is and like all the trailers are done. Like you're about to watch the movie and then just now I got to wait another minute for Nicole Kidman to say she likes movies. And like, but at the same time, it's got the meme value. So um, have bring you, the popcorn guy back. Has, has anybody done Uber Eats popcorn? If you're listening, if you're in Chicago, <laughs> Chicago, and I believe Indianapolis, I could be wrong on that. Or like it's a, I forget where AMC did it. They what didn't fucking they didn't do it here. I did. Just, I did something different at the theater yesterday. I got a hot dog. Yeah, I did see you. Did. I, yeah, I, I got did a, see. I got see a, hot dogs aren't bad. I did. I did a double showing of uh, what was it? Bullet Train at like ten thirty in the morning. <laughs> and I was just sitting there munching on popcorn, and I like got halfway through the bag and was like, I don't want this. I won't. I, I won't. I won't, I won't pretend I, got, I like I was into dog. the move. Yeah. Oh uh, no, it wasn't. It wasn't a good move, but I was extremely hungover and needed like something greasier. AMC than the popcorn. makes good food. <laughs> this this is at they Regal. Do. They still brought the chicken fingers back. Oh yeah. Regal has great chicken fingers. Great chicken fingers. I, I, if Regal you've done sponsor. Uber Eats popcorn, let me know. Mm -hmm. I want to know because Uber Eats popcorn for AMC has started, and I want to know how it is. It's going to be stale as fuck. I can already taste it. Yeah, they're going to have to have like a weird delivery system, like a, something to put it in. It'll keep it. Fun. What if they made the Uber Eats driver buy tickets when they go into? <laughs> they, have to buy, they have to buy a movie ticket every time. Um, Manscaped, our third sponsor of this podcast today. Uh, it's, almost, it's almost the fall. 
Uh, don't don't let things get wild in the fall, folks. Mm -hmm. Just because the summer is uh, winding down, I'm not a big rush summer guy. But you know, you got be aware. You got to groom in the summer as well. Yep. Um, but there's still August ahead, September. It's some of the hottest months across the country. So you definitely want to be manscaped up. The performance package 4.0 has everything you need. Uh, the lawnmower 4.0. Uh, it's the electric trimmer, skin safe technology, no nicks. Won't be bleeding. The weed whacker for ear and nose hair. Never, never, never pull your nose hairs. You could die. Uh huh. LCB, like that's a that's our biggest lesson. If anything is learned from this pod. Yep. You don't not pull a, your nose not hairs. A lesson I've learned. You could die. <laughs> I'll have to die before I learn that lesson. <laughs> crop preservers, the anti-chafing ball deodorant, crop reviver, ball spray toner, the magic mat, uh, disposable shaving mats. Don't don't shave over your sink and clog your sink for for your entire household or apartment. Uh, yeah. Get 20% off free shipping with code LIGHTS, L I G H T S at manscaped.com. That's 20% off free shipping with code LIGHTS at manscaped.com. We're going to have two interviews here, and then we will do our reviews. First up, we have uh, JJ Perry. Fantastic, fantastic insight into the stunt world. Real How the Sausage is Made interview. Yep. Really cool guy. Yeah, he, it, was, it was awesome. He talked to him for like two hours, man. He was cool. Yeah, we're going we're gonna to do, a, we're gonna do a, like a fight scenes draft, so I'm going to yeah. have him back for sure. Here's our I'll interview. Be- all right, we have an awesome one today. We are very excited to get into the world of not just day shift, but stunt work and so much more. JJ Perry, day shift, Netflix, August 12th, directorial debut, and you're debuting with, with a pretty. I, I, what's the. You're talking to two people who don't speak, write, or read well. I'm going to say bombastic debut. Um, a blue collar dad provides for his family as a San Fernando Valley pool cleaner, which is secretly a front. For a union of vampire hunters, Jamie Foxx, Dave Franco, Megan Good, Carlos Souza, Snoop Dogg. I, I could have just said Snoop Dogg. That would have let it off well. But uh, incredible vibe with this movie. Directorial debut. You've worked on plenty of movies in the past. As, as big as it gets, as comedic as it gets. But how about debuting in the director role with a movie like this? How excited are you for people to finally see this? Brother, I'm, I couldn't tell you how stoked I am. Like, we got out of the Army in 1990 and getting in this business, the stunt business, and for 32 years and having worked with so many awesome people, you know, I never thought I was going to get a shot at directing. I always thought, I'm happy directing second unit, and I don't know if you're familiar with what second unit is, yep. but a second unit director is the guy that directs all the action in the big action films. So... You know, getting this opportunity at 54 years old for me was like, it was a huge win. <laughs> Never expected it. When I got out of the army, I didn't even expect to, to go very far in the stunt business. I was pretty sure I was going to mess that up and be right back in the army. So it's kind of like I can't not win the lottery. And then getting Jamie Foxx to be in my movie was like a whole nother win. So for me, it was like, I, you know, I could have closed my eyes and hit a home run. I was like, holy shit, it's happening. And uh, yeah, it's, it was a perfect storm for me. Yeah, that's I, that is the perfect term because I feel like some directorial debut, like nowadays, it's like, and this is not a knock on this because like Sean Baker and Steven Soderbergh shot movies on iPhones, but like it's like you have like it's like you direct something on your iPhone, small crew, small, you got Jamie Foxx in the fucking movie, like that. That's mm-hmm. it's, it's kind of hard to top that. Like one, especially action comedy, like that. That's that's pretty. That's pretty big. It is. It is, man. And you know, like I got to work with Jamie Foxx briefly on um, on Django. And um, being from South Texas and him being from uh, Northeast Texas, he's got that same familiar twang in his voice. We hit it off really well. And again, you know, like as soon as as soon as he signed on to be Bud, I was like, you know, I just was like, oh, my God, this is going to be a rocket. And, you know, like directorial debut, I had plenty of time to prep this movie. Um, I'd been working on the script for I got the script from uh, Sean, uh, Sean Reddick and Yvette Yates over at Impossible Dream. Tyler Tice writ, wrote it. We got to get into it. It wasn't a, a huge movie when I got it. It was more like an indie film, but very cool. I saw I saw right away what I loved, which is a lot like Big Trouble in Little China meets Lost Boys meets Evil Dead meets the original Fright Night. You know, what, the movies from my heyday that were action, comedy, horror, all three elements. You know, like you had you keep the you have the obvious you have the audience you have the upper hand on the audience when you have those three elements because you can scare them. You can make them laugh and you can make them ooh and ah from the action. So for me, getting to turn it into this smaller film, into this massive, just put big teeth on it. And uh, then went to Chad Stahelski, uh, who's an old friend of mine. We started in the stunt business back in 90 together. 
we've been in cahoots for 32 years. And, you know, he was actually in uh, London while I was doing Fast and Furious 9. I was directing second unit on that. He was in London prepping John, no, promoting John Wick 3. I'm hanging out with him and Reeves. And he says to me, he goes, hey, man, Netflix is coming to me with his first look deal. Do you have anything? And I was like, Bubba. And I'd already shot and cut the first action sequence as a stunt biz. I did a vampire genogram, lookbook, the whole thing. I just kind of slid it across the table and said, give this a look. By the time he landed in LAX, two days later, he called me, goes, dude, we're, we're, we're making this movie. And that's all she wrote, you know, and uh, here we are. I can't believe that it, it, it happened and this is all happening, you know. I like how you mentioned Stahelski and how he's a producer and all that. Uh, a lot of stuntmen now have become directors. And Stahelski is one of them. We interviewed Sam Hargrave not that long ago. Actually, that might have been like two years ago now at this point. Yeah, but it's, it's like a trend now. Why do, why, do you, now. Yeah. Why, why do you think that's a trend now? So I'll tell you, you know, humbly, having been in this business for 32 years and done over 150 features and over 300 episodes of TV and filming in 36 countries, there was a period in the early millennium where – visual effects directors, supervisors were becoming directors because they were doing animatic pre-visits. And the studio was like, oh my God, they can direct. The difference between us and them is we have a human experience. We train the actors constantly, we're training them. So we're directing them. We're, the best way to fake making them a badass is just make them into a badass, teach them how to fight, teach them how to shoot guns. And you're getting this close, you're, we get closer to them than anyone else because we're all over them, you know, like for six, eight, 12 weeks at a time. Like I'll tell you, give you an example. When we did John Wick 2, we, Keanu Reeves trained for four months. We were in training camps with him for four months. Like when I did the movie Warrior with Tom Hardy and Joel Edgerton, that was a three month uh, training camp to get them trained like MMA fighters. So what happened is, is um, Stahelski and Dave Leach, it, it started with um, Hal Needham back in the day when you'd smoking the bandit, like back in the seventies. No one is going to direct action better than the guys who created it. And if you talk about the big action movies right now, and you can call out almost any action movie, and I'm going to tell you that the director didn't direct the action. I'm going to tell you the second unit director directed mm. the action. So what it is now is we're, we're bringing that wherewithal. Because if we, you know, like after doing four, five, six movies a year, you get this, you get this um, it's like muscle memory where you just know what to do. And you're on set with Ang Lee, Jet Lee, Spike Lee, you know, like all these, Soderbergh, like I've worked with all these epic act, uh, directors and also first and second time directors. So you learn from what the great ones did right and what the new ones did wrong. So when my time came, strangely, I knew exactly what to do. And, um, you know, luckily, and was given the opportunity by Chad and Netflix to kind of run with it. Chad was doing John Wick 4 while I was shooting my movie. So I was there doing it in Atlanta. We shot most of it in Atlanta. But, uh, but yeah, that's that's kind of what it comes from. And I'll tell you, you know, as a guy that's seen behind the curtain now, uh, it's infinitely harder to lock up Edinburgh, Scotland or Havana, Cuba or Cartagena, Colombia and do a massive car chase with 14 cars, six motorcycles, a helicopter and explosions than it is to direct a few actors in a room doing dialogue unless you don't have good actors. So <laughs> for me, you know, all of that technical no knowledge of, of how to it's like a game of pool. Where's your shot? But I know my next four leads where I'm not just shooting and looking for another shot. I know what my next four shots are every time I take a shot. So it, and that comes with experience and directing a lot of second units. So it was my directorial debut for first unit, but I've been directing second unit since 2000. So it, it came naturally for me. And it was a blessing, again, to get this amazing cast. And you can imagine it being on the road for 32 years. I know crews all over the world. I know who the, I know who all of it and who everyone is. So I just, when I called, uh, you know, I got this A-list shooting crew that came to help me with my production designer, my DP, my wardrobe props, and the amazing stunt team that I have that I've been on the road with forever. So it was, it all just kind of fell into place and it, it was very natural. It wasn't, the, the, the only thing that really scared me, in all honesty, was the comedy. Because I think I'm funny, mm. but I don't know if I'm funny or not. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Everyone's yeah, when, problem, right? <laughs> yeah, dog, but when you get Jamie Foxx and you get Dave Franco and you get these guys together, you know, I worked on a movie years ago called Spy with Paul Feig, who's a, I, I'm a big fan of him as, a, you know, as a, a comedy director, director in general. I paid attention to what he did on that movie and he would let the camera roll and come with alts and he would just create a momentum. So I would just keep the camera rolling. We'd put a fresh card in there every time we'd start something. And I said, go back to one, do it again. Okay, back to one, do it again. So with Franco and, 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 um, and Jamie, they just made everything pop. They took what was on the page and 
and, ex and made it exponentially better. I thought I was super, super grateful that it all worked out in the end. You guys had some really cool fight sequences within this movie. Um, I think one of the things I kind of liked about it, I love the throws and a lot of the unnatural bending that you see throughout it. How did you guys uh, put that together? Was that a, a lot of wires, a lot of CGI, a combination of both? So I learned how to do this, this make movies in the 90s when there was no CGI. So we did everything in camera. And what I did with the contortion is I shot it in reverse. And then I used oh. a special frame rate. Hmm. So you can't, you can't slam a contortionist down on a table and fold them in half. You'll break them because they're extremely ama they're amazing athletes, but they're also not a bundle of fast twitch muscle. So you have to be careful. So we would put them in their second position and then unfold them, pull them out of that position with wires. Okay. And then you use a special frame rate. And there's a bunch of tells. Um, hair is a tell. Like it, you got to put their hair up in a bun. You can't have fire smoke in the background because it looks weird. There's a bunch of, and there's a magic frame rate that I will share for a certain price with anyone that wants to know what the magic frame rate is. <laughs> Beautiful. County. That's it. But yeah, no, it just came from r and And strangely, I discovered that back in 2014 on a movie in Hungary because I'm a bit dyslexic. And when I, sh when I was shooting and cutting the, um, the previous, I would watch everything forward and backwards. And I noticed one of the reactions in reverse looked better. So I've been pitching this reverse photography thing to every director I've worked with since 2014 and no one wanted to use it. So I'm grateful for that. I'm grateful that nobody wanted to use it and I got to use it in my movie. So super stoked about that. Perfect. That's, Small blessing. Yeah. That's yeah. fascinating. I, I, those, it's funny cause we, I've actually brought them up oddly enough a couple of times recently. And we're going to talk about a movie they talked about and we'll get to it in a second, but the, the uh, corridor digital on YouTube, they break down all like, uh, special effects, practical CGI, all that stuff. And I find they do great breakdown. Some of the best in the business of like special effects. I find tricks like that to be so fascinating, so much more fascinating than even the com computer CGI work is unreal, but like a, a crazy practical trick to get a shot done. Is there, is there like a, is there anything else like that, that, that you use on this movie other than that one that, people would never think of because it's just a trick of the trade? Unfortunately, action filmmaking is a dying art because everybody says now, oh, let's just fix it in post. It becomes digital. Um, again, like working in Hong Kong in the 90s, like with Corey Yun and, 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 and that whole crew, you had to figure out how to do things in camera. You know, like the Corman group and, you know, a lot that whole 80s and 90s, the films that I grew up watching, CGI, like if you watch the CG in, in, in even the, the Terminator 2, it's, it's not, it doesn't hold up. I love the movie, but it doesn't hold up. I never wanted to rely on visual effects. I wanted to use visual effects to augment or make better what I had done already. Mm. So there's a lot of action filmmaking that's in the movie from years of experience on the road besides reverse photography. And we also took drone photography to another level because the, the, um, the race drones, we're using race drones now which is a way more kinetic look. Like if you think about car chases, when the Russian arm, we're going to call it the Ukraine now because we don't call it Russian arm anymore. But <laughs> we'll, but but the Russian arm back in the in the late eighties, early nineties, changed the way that car chases looked. Right? It gave it another mm -hmm. perspective. Well, race drones now, FPV drones are now giving another an additional perspective which is way more ballistic and way more more fast the only way to fake speed is just using speed so there's a shot in my movie where we're in the car behind two people driving and then the car slides and we threw the drone out of the sunroof and went right back into the car chase now i won't tell you what we've been r and Ding because i'm saving it for night shift or my next my next directorial debut but we didn't have a ton of time you know we shot day shift in 42 days so we didn't have a ton of time, but I've spent a lot of time with uh, my FPV brothers and my stunt brothers r and since day shift, what we learned to make it even better. So I'll tell you the next vehicular chase I do will be, will be groundbreaking. Interesting. That's a great fucking tease. I love that. Yeah. <laughs> That's a yeah. solid tease. Do you think, and this, I don't know, I mean, you, you've worked on, I mean, literally the biggest of movies. The, the biggest of big movies and actually fast and furious for the avatars of the world, stuff like that. But do you, so you may have a better, you'll have a good take on this. I imagine. Do you think though, cause you said that action's a dying art. There's a very common denominator in the two movies I'm going to mention. It's called, his name is Tom Cruise. So that might have to do with it. Big budget. They can do it, but Top Gun Maverick 
uh, the most recent Mission Impossible Fallout, all the, the, the most three re- most recent Mission Impossibles. Do you think, though, that the success of those might push people to be like, hey, let's really lean into the practical more and more again with action? Or is it just one of those things where you need Tom Cruise, you need the money, and that's really all that's ever going to happen with that? I, I bet really heavy on doing everything practical just because I think it's more visceral and, visceral and real when there's gravity and consequences involved. And it also gets a way better reaction from the performers when you have something really coming at you. I mean, Tom Cruise for me, like Jackie Chan. So Jackie Chan oh, yeah. is for my, I'm a big up fan of Tom Cruise, but Jackie Chan is one of my idols and I'll tell you why. Because he was a stuntman first. He was a stuntman and entered the dragon with Bruce Lee all the way back to the late sixties, early seventies. Then he became a director. And he changed the way that action movies were shot, the fight movies were shot. Police story, man. Yeah, well, police story, Armor of God, Project A1 and 2, Meals on Wheels, Dragons Forever. I can go through the mid-80s and tell you that they, they couldn't paint wires out. So they had to make the background with slats so the wires hid in the slats. I mean, they used every trick in the book. And for me, that is the gold standard. Tom Cruise is amazing. He does all, like, I, when I saw Top Gun, I... I exhaled because I said, okay, good. Um, thank God we signed, we, we've worked hard and we are indeed our stuff because there are consequences in reality. We shot it all practically. I was a big fan. And I think the Mission Impossible movies are maybe the gold standard now. The John Wick movies and the Mission Impossible yep. movies are all my favorite action movies. Uh, I haven't worked on a, a, a Mission Impossible, but I'd love to. I'm a huge fan that they do everything for real. And Cruz gets out there and hangs himself out there. You know, like he's, he's invested. And it's hard to get actors to do that. You know, it's hard to get studios to let you get actors to do that because of the consequences of failure. <clears throat> so in a long, a long story short, what you don't see is when you see the Tom Cruise movie, you didn't probably see the three months of prep that some stunt team had to do to make sure that it was going to be flawless for Mr. Cruise. Not taking any way, anything away from how big Tom Cruise's balls are because he's got a giant set of nabs and respect. But... He's the only one right now really doing it. Him and Reeves are the only two, and Fox are the only ones that are out there really hanging it out there. Like, every actor goes out and does their business. But, like, if you look at the Marvel films, they have a mask on. When they have yeah. a mask on, do you think that's – who do you think that is, you know? You could probably have a guess it's not them. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. The, uh, there's kind of – I would love to ask you this one just because I've always found it interesting the way actors and stuntmen too also approach this. There's like kind of the two schools of thought on the actors doing their own stunts where there's some people who are like, this is great for the movie because people can physically see like Jackie Chan or Tom Cruise or Keanu Reeves doing all these things physically. But also there's another school of thought where some actors are like, well, we're taking work away from professionals. And if I get hurt, then it derails the movie in a sense. Negative. I'll, I'll tell you why, because the stunt team has to be on there for, you know, one and a half to three months prepping anyway. And his stunt double standing right there anyway, for sure. So, you know, the, the goal of the movie is, you know, as a, as a stunt coordinator, my job is to help the director with his or her vision of the move, of the action in the movie and make sure it's done in a safe manner. Make sure that nobody gets hurt or injured. Um, but I think that that's what people are paying to see. I mean, Reeves is a great example of. You know, we trained him in jujitsu and in judo. We call it gun jitsu. We took him out to the three gun range. And the only way, the best way to fake making him a badass was just train him and make him into a badass. So teaching him seven throws that he could perfect, eight transition, how to use rifle, shotgun, pistol, reload, correct malfunction, barricading, triangulating, crossfire, et cetera. Just make him that dude was what paid off in the end. So I don't think that anyone's taking away anything from anyone. And I think that's what people are paying to see. You know, like when somebody says, um, oh, did you see this movie? What's the first question somebody asks? Oh, who's in it? Right. Mm -hmm. But that's what they want to know. That's what the audience is paying to see. They're paying to see Dwayne Johnson, Vin Diesel, Jason Statham, Keanu Reeves, Jamie Foxx, Will Smith. They're paying to see that movie star who they love. And we all love do these, you know, crazy stories. So our job is to help them achieve that at the end of the day. Yeah. Did you, speaking of, of, of Keanu Reeves, and obviously he's in, he's in the fucking Matrix, so I'm not saying like John Wick made him a star, but he obviously had a rebirth with John Wick that has turned him back into a star at the, I'd almost argue above the level, just due to social media and everything that he was with the Matrix. Did you, did you, and obviously you're going to trust the art that you're you're making, but did you have any sense that that was going to happen? You're training him, you're like, we are, we are starting a, 
a franchise, a character that is going to become immediately iconic. So John Wick 1 was shot in New York. And I was doing Expendables 3 when I got a call from Stahelski. Hey, man, I need you to come down and help out with this club scene, the club shootout scene. Oh, great and you know, because, scene. I was, oh. because I was in the Army, and I'd been playing with guns for a while, and, and you know, I'd been co- in cahoots with those guys. He called me to help him out with that. And while we were shooting it, that club scene, you know, when he, he runs out of bullets, he flicks it, he hits the guy in the neck, he does a reload, shoot, like all of those, like, plug-and-play moments and mixing with the jujitsu. While we were in the monitors, we were all saying the same thing. Holy shit, we're on one. We're on one. Because we'd seen it before. We'd been doing it in pre before. But other actors never wanted to do it. Reeves just embraced it and, and crushed it. So we could tell. I could just, you know, we could all see it in the monitors. And then you also had Chad Stahowski and Dave Leach and Darren Prescott and Johnny Sabe. You had this ama- amazing action team of, you know, directors. Everybody's putting their heart and soul into it especially Keanu Reeves. I mean, he's, he's amazing. You know, like him and Fox to me, and I don't know Tom Cruise personally, but I, I'd imagine that he's, you know, no holds barred. They no you know, no mission too difficult, no sacrifice too great. You know, that's that the mentality that goes there. And uh, when you have that with an, with a, with a lead performer, like your starting pitcher, if he's that they're that he or she is that into it, like Charlize in atomic blonde, you know, mm-hmm. you really can't go wrong. Now it's just, you're just creating an opportunity to make them succeed. And there's another thing about coverage, how you shoot the action. When you have a double, you have to, you have to protect it with overs. You're shooting over the shoulder of the double. When you're not using a double, you put that camera where the action is the star of the, the sequence. You put the, mm-hmm. the camera where it goes. You're not hiding anything. You're not trying to hide anything. When you have two actors fighting, and you have to double both of them. It becomes very tricky. You know what I mean? Then your coverage, you, you're doubling your coverage and you're cutting away and you're cutting to overs, the audience knows something isn't right. So taking the actors and making them as badass as you can and having them embrace that process. Warrior was another example of that for me as well. Like, great movie. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, I was, I was super stoked. It was years and years ago and Gavin O'Connor was, was the director, really did a great job of letting us train the actors hard and you know, like really just was, was all in on, on making them as badass as we could make them. So we had a badass boot camp. but that's what it is, you know, when, when the actor actress is as invested as every as the as the action department, you know, when you call it an action movie, you have to call it an action movie. Like, is it, I always say the same thing when someone is reluctant to train or do something. I say, well, is it a comedy? Well, no. Is it a a drama? No. Is it an action movie? Well, yeah. Say it again. Yeah, it's an action movie. Say it again. Mm-hmm. Hallelujah. Well, you got to invest in that financially and with time. You know, it doesn't just happen. I like how you mentioned just those sort of techniques because you do notice it when it's like a um like a scene where they have to do all these quick cuts and like move around so you can't see who's actually doing the fighting. But then when you do something like John Wick and you can get a stable shot of whatever is happening, like in, you mentioned like the Three Dragons trilogy is like, or Dragons Forever trilogy, honestly, like you watch something like that where Jackie Chan, Sammo Hung, like Yuan Bao, they're all fighting. You can see in a stable shot, them do like 15, 16 hits in a row before they cut to another thing. It just is a totally different experience versus watching something that were like a Jason Bourne or whatever. Yeah. So for me, I'll just let you know, because I worked in Hong Kong a bunch in Hong Kong, when you work there, especially when they're doing it, there are two directors. There's the director who directs the story. And then when they start fighting, that director gets up and leaves. And then there's an action director comes in and takes over. And that's kind of what has happened in the last 12, 13 years in Hollywood, where second unit has gotten a lot more because now there's more content being made than any time in the history of TV, cinema or film, or there's just more stuff being made. And people, the, the standards are getting higher and higher. Like you can't just like, I, look, I love Die Hard, but when you watch Die Hard now, if you show it to a 17 year old, they're going to go, they're going to be bored and be looking at their Instagram in 15 minutes, you know? So mm-hmm. I think it's an awesome film, but right now they want to see a gag has, something has to happen every eight minutes or you're going to lose their attention, a gag, a joke, a stunt or something. So, yeah, I think that the, the standard is higher. The kids that are playing video games and watching anime so the expectations are higher and using the Reeves example so we call it reverse first person shooter we're always on Reeves Mm. and then we're pulling him and people are coming and he's taking them out until it starts to fall apart we find out where it falls apart then we let him through and wrap and then we cut and go again so that's kind of the mantra that we use reverse first person or the John Wick shot and uh, and that's how we play it (laughs) I love yeah, that. We uh, we're running out, of, running out of time here. We're gonna have to have you back on. We're gonna have to do like a a rankings or draft of best fight scenes or something. This is fascinating. But I gotta mm-hmm. know 
quick before we go, you you were on the crew for Scorpion King, right? Yes. Have you have you seen the movie Nope or have you heard about the connection to Scorpion King? No. In the movie oh. Nope, the Daniel Kaluuya's character, his family worked on Scorpion King. So the whole movie, he has a Scorpion King 2001 crew on the back on the back of the hoodie. It's like it is <laughs> Such a good Hollywood reference. It's unbelievable. I just, yeah, I didn't know if you'd mm. seen that or heard about that yet. It's great. I haven't met. I'm a big fan. I got to do the, the reshoots on that. And that's where I met Dwayne Johnson and met his cousin, Tunnel Y. Reeves. We went on to do the rundown right after that together. Mm, yeah. I got William Scott on that and won some, me and his double won a bunch of awards falling down a mountain. So, you know, like I have a special affinity for, for Dwayne Johnson. He's, he's one of my faves as well. He's like a, he's like a dude. He used to play football, wrestle, like, you know, eats burgers, you know, like yeah, yeah. <laughs> lots, so many I burgers, cheat meals are crazy. Uh, day <laughs> shoot. Go ahead. I'm go ahead, so go, stoked. Go ahead, go ahead. All those, all those Chan films from the eighties dog. I'm super stoked. You just made my Christmas list. Oh man. This, all those, all of his movies from that, like you were saying, like it's the condor ones. It's like you watch Indiana Jones and go back to back and watch those. It's like, this is, it's incredible. I, I love those movies so much. Agreed. Agreed. There's a there's a stunt out before I before I just tell you in Hong Kong in the 90s, yeah. they used to they used to have a stunt called a Weeboo stunt. When you were going to do something, they would come to you and say, oh, you're going to do a Weeboo stunt now. And you'd be like, what's that? And you say after stunt, Weeboo, Weeboo, Weeboo. So, <laughs> they were that, was Chan, that was Chan on Police Story. Yeah, exactly. Uh, that was Chan when he's falling through that uh, that one scene with the lights where he shot it on 15 different yeah. angles and showed every angle in the movie. <laughs> and then he just had to immediately go to the hospital. I love it. You know you're going. They got the they got the ambulance back, backed up right to the doors. You know, don't yeah. worry, JJ. Oh, That's Russian boys. It looks just like you. After you go, we'll replace you. <laughs> Thanks for that, guys. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, thank you so much. Day shift, August 12th, Netflix. We we got to have you back on to talk more, but check it out. Congrats on the directorial debut. I'm sure the, the, the first of May. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you, you, brothers. Bear. All right. From stuntman to legend, the Pixar voice. The Cheers man himself, John Ratzenberger. He talks about almost dying. You almost sound like John Ratzenberger was a stunt man before he was. <laughs> yes, he was. He was. John Ratzenberger did his own stunts on yeah. the set of Cheers. Big stunt guy in yeah. ESB. Uh, Ted Danson had three stunt doubles on Cheers. Unbelievable. Is, is that true? No. <laughs> okay, I was like, uh, maybe. I don't know. If, I didn't know Cheers got that acrobatic. Um, here we go. John Ratzenberger. Then two reviews. Okay, we are very pleased, honored. To be joined by the one and only John Ratzberger. Thank you so much for for joining us. Talk. We were just talking about our Hawaiian shirts as we started. Mm -hmm. We are matching. We are basically matching. Would you consider us matching? Let's see. Let me put my glasses on. Let's see. I'm like the less tan version of him. It's like <laughs> I lived under a cave and he got out into the sun. I think you guys grew up on the same block anyway. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's we usually we usually get like, are you brothers? And we're like, no. I'm like, well, you dress alike, you're white and you have yeah, beard. So yeah. you look quite the same. <laughs> what 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 city are you in? Maybe that explains it. And it's New York. New York. But he's from Long Island. I'm from Connecticut slash Texas. So it's really all over. Mm -hmm. Oh really? Which which part of Connecticut? Uh right outside uh, right outside of Hartford, Farmington, Bristol area. Got it. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I grew up in Bridgeport. I mm -hmm. my my sister went to Sacred Heart. I know you're very familiar with Sacred Heart. So yeah. Oh yeah. Big. Big, big, big Connecticut. I'm a, I'm a New Englander at heart, but then also a Texan. I dab, I cheat a little bit. I dabble with both. Yeah, yeah. yeah. The, uh, hey, so, the no, sorry. So uh, the you, movie we're gonna talk about today is Luck. By the way, yeah, got it right up here for you. I see that. Very what, nice. Thank you. What number role is this for you? Do you have Do you have it jotted down somewhere? Number. I would say we'll no. Say I you know I I try to keep my my brain and my life as simple as possible. They they call and I go. <laughs> what can after we expect I, from, from after Luck? I finish, I come back home. <laughs> what can we expect from Luck? How is it maybe different than some other stories that we've seen uh, in in these animated movies, which which all are so great, just not just to look at, but the stories are always so deep and always have some other meaning, but also fun and for everybody. What can we expect with Luck? You know, the first thing that I, I really struck me was the color, the green you see behind you. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's it's so pleasant and pleasing, and and I'm thinking that that must mean you know luck of the Irish, uh, green Ireland. I don't know where that came from, but I really enjoyed that. But yeah, my uh, family and I, my granddaughter and uh, two two of them went to see it Saturday, the screening, and they both loved it. Mm -hmm. 
And uh, so that was, you know, the, the benchmark for me. Uh, and there's a lot of kids there. So this, this, this movie is safe to bring your children, which a lot of animated features now aren't. Mm. This is definitely a kids friendly. Uh, we're going to put that out on our, uh, our little like blurb yeah, about it. Kid friendly. Take your kids take, to take, luck. Take, take, take um, this is the first animated movie of the Skydance partnership. Is it kind of like cool to get in the ground floor of something new, especially in the animated world? Well, I, uh, I go by, you know, dance with the one who brought you. Ever hear that expression? Oh yeah. yeah. And the one who brought me was John Lasseter. Mm. So John calls, I put on my shoes and I walk out the door. And I, and I and I record because the other thing too because he's he's such a stickler for detail it's kind of like the old school way of making movies. I don't, it, it, I, let's see what's a good like it's a wonderful life that's a good example. Mm -hmm. If you look at the background of that movie, every single face is telling a story. There's a lot of detail in the background. That's because there was no uh, video village. There was no little tiny screen that the director was staring at, you know, uh, 20 yards away. The directors were right next to the camera, watching every little detail. So that's why movies made back then are the details much better. And because animation is a, uh, a system where you, you're actually drawing the background, the background in animation to me is today much more interesting than uh, regular movies. Mm. I, actually, I, I worked with John Schlesinger. Uh, you know, he did Midnight Cowboy and Yanks and other things. And, and he, he and I became pretty good friends. And I asked him, he had, he had the crew putting a little bit of white on a roof of a barn. It was way in the background. It had to be 400 yards away. I said, John, why would you hold up your filming just to put a little bit of white on the corner of that barn? He said, every frame of a movie should be f able to hang on your wall mm -hmm. as a painting. Mm -hmm. like and that. That, that little bit of white in the background would bring out the background. And that was quite a lesson for me. So even uh, when I started directing uh, you know, TV and whatnot, I always remembered that. It's, you're painting a picture. But now, because I guess film schools spread the uh, the habit of uh, you know watching a little screen in the video village, and you're not standing next to the camera seeing what's in the actor's eyes. You're sitting, you're on a little screen, so you're not paying attention to the background. Like how many movies or TV shows, for that matter, have you seen where a couple is having an argument in a restaurant, and the people at the table next to them aren't aren't even reacting? Mm -hmm. To me, that means the director didn't really care. But a director who cares, like you know, John Lasseter in animation, the background is as important as the foreground. And uh, a lot of uh, filmmakers have forgotten that. But you know, in animation, you can't forget that because you're actually creating the background. Yeah, yeah. That, that is interesting because we. We who do we talk to? We talked to someone. Oh, we talked to Don Johnson. We're talking about yeah. Quentin Tarantino. Quentin Tarantino is very adamant about that, still saying he likes to be underneath the lens and says, I and was just not many I who do just, that. I, I, well, I'm sorry, say it again. But not many who do that anymore. No, but that's real movie making because uh, you know, I didn't know Quentin Tarantino did that, but uh, in the list of favorite films, his are always on it, and that's probably the reason because you, 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 you're studying the whole picture. You're not just in the little foreground and two actors talking because your audience is seeing everything and you got to pay attention to that. So I'm, I'm pleased to hear that, uh, you know, he does that. I'll, I'll, I'll have to knock on his door, see if he'll put me in one of his movies. <laughs> yeah. It's like, yeah, I heard you're using this technique. You should throw me in there. Now, <laughs> I'm interested now that I heard yeah. that, Mr. Tarantino. Uh, the more and more you do of these, I mean, we date back to Toy Story to now. The more established themes and messages there are, and you go into these animated movies, whether it's you know maybe something like look, which I won't, we won't spoil anything. What the theme would be the takeaway? You go to maybe I don't know the animated Spider Man or a, a Pixar, and you, and you don't just look at something that's great and fun, but you sometimes walk away crying a lot of times, and you walk away feeling something. How important has that been to you? Not just to be involved in so many of these, but you're involved in movies that 
they say they say not just something, but sometimes a lot. Uh huh. Yeah. Well, uh, again, because the the animation process, you know, it takes a, a, a longer time, and and you're studying it, and and that, that's what. Uh, in luck, I, I saw that where I thought, gee, every animator has to really be an actor because as an actor, do something funny. You know, you've got your body has to move a certain way, and your reaction has to be a certain t- timing to it, and so an animator has to do that. Whereas the director would rely on the actors doing it, mm-hmm. but the animator does that, and that's where the heart is. Uh, is, is you spoke to, you know, the, you know, the themes that really get touch you. That's where it comes from. So with luck, obviously, luck is a big part of the movie. What's the luckiest thing you think that's ever happened to you? Or what's the unluckiest? Oh, yeah. I got a list of them. You're kidding. <laughs> Which side? Are you an unlucky or a lucky yeah. person naturally? Oh, no. I, I'd say blessed. Uh, there was at least eight times where I should have died. Oh, my uh, goodness. Died. Oh, we weren't even talking eight. like like professional stuff. Like, actually, yeah. Okay, cool. Oh, no. Professional stuff. I, I, I always assumed you're talking about real life. Oh, real life is even better. No, I that's like that. way better for the yeah. question. Eight times. Yeah. Well, I mean, uh, going back, I I was a deckhand on a ship and during a storm, and the skipper told me to, to go open the scuppers. It's a little hatch anyway. And I slipped. And I was about to fall into the ocean, fully clothed with my, uh, you know, the rubber the gear, the high boots. And uh, a wave in the skipper. It, uh, I just happened to catch on. My whole life flashed in front of me. I thought, okay, I'm gone. There's nothing I can do. I'll, I'll sink like a stone here. It was the middle of winter, cold. And I just grabbed and caught a part of the ship. And so I was able to get, get back on board. And uh, the skipper came looking for me. And he says, oh, my God. Because I was all white, I guess, and uh, so he gave me a shot of whiskey, and that was the end of that. <laughs> That's I would never go back on a boat again after that. Yeah. <laughs> well, no, that, that was my job. That's how I, you know, Fair. paid the rent. But I was out. You know, I was young as a kid. I must have been 18, 18, 19. But then in England, I was there for ten years, and I was uh, for a good part of that. When I was when I first got there, before I, you know, got to acting, uh, I was a carpenter. And I touched a live wire. Now, over there, they have two, 220 volts. And uh, here we have 110. So if you you know stick a fork in a socket, eh, you're not going to die. Mm-hmm. Over there, the, the top of your head is going to fly off. <laughs> <laughs> and I just, I because I, I, I unhooked those lights that were just over the sink. And I thought, yeah, I'll go to lunch. So I went down to the pub, had lunch, came back, and I forgot that those wires were still alive. So I touched one, and it actually lifted me up and threw me against the wall. Oh, my Ooh. God. And the, and, the, and the woman who owned the place, she came running in because she heard the thud. And again, you know, it's bottle of whiskey. She screamed. <laughs> but uh, and there was a few other you know, motorcycle crash at 80 miles an hour. I shouldn't have survived. And so, yeah, I, you, luck, blessed, whatever you want to call it. I just, you know, God's keeping me around for some reason. I, I, I'd say that like there's no one better suited to be in this movie than you, <laughs> just based yeah. on the story. I, it sounds like you need to, you know, every every actor these days has their own alcohol. I think you need to make your own whiskey. Yeah. Like, like nine, six, nine lives. Nine whiskey? lives, yeah. Well, I, mean, I was about to say something like that. Oh, okay. <laughs> you, you guys in? Yeah, we're, yeah, we're definitely okay. in on that. Absolutely. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> we'll be your right. first sponsors. Um, no, I found, actually, I found a whiskey that's if you guys are whiskey drinkers, uh, at Tullamardew. Okay. You yeah. heard of that? Of course. Yeah. Oh, yeah. It's a wonderful because every whiskey or, or alcohol, like Jack Daniels, for some reason, is an angry drink. Mm. You know, you want to get into a fight. Fight. That's a fighting uh, liquor. So yeah. Tullamardew. All you want to do is sing songs, tell stories, you know, and because I've done experiments with it, bringing it to uh, funerals after the funeral. Mm-hmm. Uh, everybody, everybody's sad. And, and so I start 
hand it out to tell them or do. Before you know it, everyone's telling funny stories and singing every single time. So that's that's my go-to whiskey. I could see taking a swig of that and then singing a full-on sea shanty, which I'm sure if you worked on a ship, you guys did so many of those, I'm sure. Well, you know, you know why right? those came about because it actually makes you stronger when you sing, doing repetitive work. Mm-hmm. I just you got the beat like that, and I tried yeah. it, and it does. You work longer, and you, you work harder. Huh. So that's where all that comes from. I have, I have no idea. We have to use that at the gym next that's, time. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, that's a real technique. Um, I'd love to ask you some general voice acting questions, just adjacent to uh, obviously your performance and luck. Um, you're the highest grossing actor we've ever interviewed, just by general box office receipts. You're number four all time, and I'm just always curious if that's sort of like a badge of honor for you and other voice acting legends, you know, like Frank Welker is like right above you in that, like Rob Berg and Alan Tudyk, like all these guys who have made such incredible animated projects. Uh, what's the question? Uh, just like if that's like a badge of honor for voice actors in general, just get being on like that. It's insane. I, I, high grossing list. Uh, truthfully, it's the only time I think about it is when talking to guys like you, when they ask the question, <laughs> I, uh, um, yeah, I mean, it's because it's box office receipts. It has nothing to do, uh, you know, with my wallet. Yeah. You know? That, that's a good point. I never really thought about it that way. Yeah, uh, it, it, it is funny. It's like, oh, this person's the highest grossing this. Like, well, uh, they're just in it. Reflect it in the wall. I'm going to ch- up my that's why we're That's why we're going to make the whiskey. <laughs> exactly, yeah. <laughs> I mean, if I was if I was at every theater and had uh, uh, somebody I hired at every theater with a big burlap bag, you know, put the money in the bag. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and then it's then it's a difference. But uh I, that, nothing right, to do right. with me. Ratzenberger's coffers. Yeah, think. careful. It's a Ratzenberger yeah. movie in theaters. You, they're gonna shake you down when you walk <laughs> out. Yeah. Got the baseball bat. Uh not just cheers when it comes to iconic. You were also uh, you you had a very small role, uh though when it comes to this franchise, nothing is small because fans are crazy like ourselves. In my what I think is the best movie ever made, The Empire Strikes Back. Uh, ah. should, no surprise to you. I know you, you, this, it, it you get this from fans. Uh, you, you, you did play a uh, major Brent Derlin. You, you survived your character in star Wars lore survived, uh, right. fought in the return of the Jedi, not you yourself, but you were the empire strikes back. Did you ever think that when you did that movie, small role still though, coming off of star Wars, which had just become, you know, an monster. unreal monster hit. But did you ever think even that small, tiny role years later would still get brought up to you? Because Star Wars fans are just are a different breed of people. Oh, again, us included. Yes. I, it, you know, I, I maybe I'm that much of a knucklehead, but I, I, by the time I drove out of the parking lot, I'd forgotten. I, I never gave it another thought until. Like, oh my god! I got a, a action figure. Yeah, <laughs> you know that's a, that's a big deal. <laughs> when did it start popping up, though? Like, when did did you see maybe start to people maybe bring it up to you? Maybe at a convention or something, or like somewhere you'd be at talking about other projects. Did it become to like kind of rear its head of like, oh, that's that's your character. I mean, as a name, a full name, and everything. Yeah. Yeah. Um... Uh, yeah, I mean it's it's. Uh, I'm proud to have done it, and uh, I just I, I guess I think that I remember calling my mother f- from when I first drove onto the lot to do Empire Strikes Back. It was L Street Studios, North London, mm-hmm. and they gave me a parking space. And I looked at the name on the parking space next to me, and it was Kermit. <laughs> <laughs> so I called my mother. I said, Ma. I made it. My parking yeah. spot is right next to Kermit. I'm right next to the frog, Mom. <laughs> yeah. well, hold on, Mom. He's riding up on the bicycle as we speak. Yeah, uh, yeah. On the bicycle. <laughs> that's, that's but, unbelievable. Uh, I mean, you might not even realize it, but there's probably people that dress up as you and go to Star Wars conventions. There's people that dress up as all the minor characters. There's one, Will Rowe Hood. The guy is just a random guy in the background of a shot in Empire Strikes Back that's holding an ice cream maker that they tried. They dressed up to look like some futuristic piece of technology and people dress up like him like and go to conventions. Have you been to a, what the Star Wars convention? Star Wars celebration? Uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, I thought so. Yeah. Yeah. At, at Disney a few years back and uh, other conventions I've been to. There's always. Yeah. They're Star Wars uh, affectionados there. Yeah. 
Yeah, they're a blast. That's yeah, they're, they're they're they again. We are. I mean, my I actually do not have your character's action figure, but my like my home office is lined top to bottom with Star Wars action figures. Mm-hmm. And so yeah, we are we're we're a nuts group of people. We are crazy people. Yeah. Your your character's got to come back at some point. I just it needs to happen. I know you've you've been asked before and you said of course I like why would you not want to come back? But there it needs sure. to happen. Yeah. He survived. Sure, no, if they if they asked me, I'd be I'd be there. Why why say no? Hey, I will note though that there is actually, and obviously it would be could be in person, but there's also so many great Star Wars animated properties that could definitely use an animated version of your the, your, the, your the, character. The character needs to return. We have we have absolutely no say in anything Star Wars or Lucasfilm does, but I'm just saying it absolutely needs to <laughs> start the groundswell. It absolutely needs to happen. That's it. You start throwing your weight around. You'd be surprised. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, it's, it's no, uh, I would say shocker. Everyone knows that like you've been every single Pixar movie ever made. Um, I would love to know just like what your favorite Pixar movies are. Like what are the ones that you look back on and you're like, I love impossible my question. Grandkids, I know. Or showing it to other people or whatever. You know, I always, always, always had a soft spot for uh, Bugs Life. Sure. Wow. Uh, PT Flea. Yep. Yeah. It just cracks me up. His the character. I, I just because he's nuts. It he just he's so <laughs> avaricious. He'd sell his grandmother for a <laughs> salami sandwich. It, it. I I just get a kick out of, of people like that, and uh, so I had a lot of fun playing him. Bugs off. I like That's that. one of the first movies I remember. I'm so for context. I'm 31, so I saw Toy Story in theaters. Um, and I, I remember that, but a bug's life, I vividly remember like, oh, it's like Toy Story, but it's, it's bugs is different. So yeah, I, I have an affinity to it as well. Yeah. Great voice yeah. cast too. Yeah. And I, and the thing that struck me too, was that John Lasseter had the animators out in the middle of a park with magnifying glasses. <laughs> they were laying on their stomachs, sketching, looking through a magnifying glass into the grass. But that's what a you know a, a, a genius he is. He's just you know he, he's he's an artist. He's he's Walt Disney. I'm gra- I'm I'm glad you picked a Bug's Life. I I I I drive the train on we we let's not forget a Bug's Life second one. Yeah, but still absolutely outstanding. All right, rapid fire. Last thing here, very quickly, before we let you go, this is a tough question. Well, you guys got some place to go. <laughs> yeah, usually on the other usually side, the other on the side, other side. You get told yeah. to wrap quicker <laughs> one one fit your favorite it doesn't have to be your favorite movie but one of your i need to i want to know one of your favorite movies of all time could be your favorite a movie you think is incredibly underappreciated and then one movie that you would consider a, a guilty pleasure maybe some others don't love but you really enjoy um i'd say the the, the first uh category the last be the same picture be a uh, yankee doodle dandy james Cagney. Wow, really? That's rare. Yeah. You know, we often see the favorite is also the guilty pleasure. I love that. Yeah, I just it makes me cry. I just and I actually got to work with uh, James Cagney. His last movie and one of my first ragtime. Interesting. I did not know that. That's that's when Pat Pat what a great pick. Usually it's Pat, I mean, it's like we Pat get the Godfather and fellas and what's wow. that? Usually, you get like the Godfather, Goodfellas, we got a Star Wars thrown in there. But yeah, that's yeah, you do, and then you, you covered two bases with that. And then what about well, an underappreciated? Something more people should see. Laurel and Hardy. Mm, that's a great. I point. just uh, the genius of Stan Laurel. You'll see it every. That's what I learned in comedy that comedy rests between the words. It's not the words. It's what happens between words. That that's where the comedy is the the, the richest vein of laughter lies, um, but I I just love Laurel and Hardy. I just I, they could do no wrong as far as I'm concerned. It's a great answer. I, I love that. I'm gonna have to go toss on Yankee Doodle Dandy too. Yeah, that might have to be that might have to be the move for me. Thank you. So this was this was an absolute pleasure getting to talk to you. Luck, Apple TV Plus, August fifth, which actually is now that's what, day, day after tomorrow, isn't it? There you go. If you're listening to this right now, because when this interview airs, it's going to be out. Apple mm-hmm. TV Plus, go into that fantastic library they do. and press they play like on luck, and you'll hear this voice right here. And another animated, the king of animated movies, John Rafferty. That's Rafferty. it. Thank you so much for joining us. This was, this was fantastic. It's been a pleasure, gentlemen. Thank you. Thank, Thank you so you. much.
Thank you. And all right. Thank you to both of them. Fantastic stuff. Two movies today. We're going to start out with Bullet Train. Bullet Train from David Leach, who has done uh, movies that people know. Uh, Fast and Furious presents Hobbs and Shaw. Great, Deadpool great 2. movie. Deadpool 2. Atomic Blonde. Uh, all buttered on, on Lights, Camera, Barstool. Atomic Blonde had some great fucking fight scenes in it. That stairway yeah. fight was Did you put a bucket hat on? No. Gucci put I was wearing this hat. when I came in. <laughs> <laughs> you fucking idiot. I hate that. I hate that so much. That's like the exact same. <laughs> Did you own that? So Did you buy that after Bullet Train? No, I've always had this. <laughs> always had that this. would have been a great AMC, like, uh, what do you call it, tie-in thing? Like, instead of a bucket of popcorn, you get a bucket hat to put the popcorn <laughs> yeah, in. They, yeah. they, had them. they had them at Regal with Bullet Train on the embroidered like, really? bucket. And I was, really? like, I was like, can I buy that? And they're like, no, sorry. Aww. I was like, please, can I buy it? <laughs> Jesus. Oh, my God. Uh, Bullet Train. Unlucky assassin Ladybug, played by Brad Pitt, is determined to do his job peacefully after one too many gigs gone off the rail. Uh, fate, however, may have other plans as Ladybug's latest mission puts him on a collision course with lethal adversaries from around the globe, uh, all with connected yet conflicting objectives on the world's fastest train. Brad Pitt. Br- Brad Pitt. <laughs> That's a guy who's like a Brad CEO Pitt. of something. Uh, Aaron Taylor Johnson, Brian Tyree Henry, Joey King, Zazie Beetz, Bad Bunny, Andrew Koji, uh, Michael Shannon. Uh, that's feel like a kind of a spoiler, but um, uh, no, he's in the he's in the title he's, he's listed. Yeah. That's yeah, true. That's true. The, uh... Uh, a couple cameos as well, which I won't say. Yeah. A couple funny cameos. Mm-hmm. Um, this is n- a very audience to critic. Big difference right now. Audience is to critic. Critic audience uh, critics do not like this movie. Uh, it has a very low approval percentage of Rotten Tomatoes. It's in the 50s, I believe. Audiences don't – they're not head over heels for this movie, mm-hmm. but they do like it. Uh, I, I enjoyed Bullet Train quite a bit. It has – I'll say how what I compared it to. I said it's like somebody trained for a half marathon. They, they hit their half. They got, they got through 13 miles, and they said, you know what? I can do a few more. And mm-hmm. they did a few more, and the few more were just rough. Like they were puking a little bit. Things weren't great. They were passing out. This movie is, I think, awesome for a long while. And then it just – it starts kind of like throwing up. And not like projectile vomiting all over itself. Like Baby Yoda in uh, the Razor Crest in Mandalorian where it just kind of like <laughs> dribbles out. You're like, ah, oh, man. You're just doing too much bullet train. This is a little too much going on <laughs> right now. Do you remember now. that infamous meme picture of the guy shooting his pants during the marathon? <laughs> like maybe it's like that guy. Yeah. The guy with diarrhea. I, I Again, I, I really enjoyed this movie like quite a bit. But it's it, – it just it, – I, I – it's just above average. It's close to good. I can't put it in like the good territory um, because I just think the end is just so muddied yeah. that it kind of gave me – I actually didn't really enjoy it. <laughs> and that's a problem, which sucks because I feel like the first two-thirds of it I really loved and then it just kind of stumbled off. Mm-hmm. Uh, Jeremy Johns, the YouTuber, compared it. Now, granted, I was half paying attention, so I don't know if he was comparing it completely, but he kind of gave a Smoke and Aces comparison, and I actually yeah. sort of like that. Now, Smoke and Aces, I, I, I actually think this is like a well-made movie. Smoke and Aces, it does. Yeah, it's I don't love, smoke and Aces, but it's the though. same thing. Where Smoke and Aces, I will say, the ending of Smoke and Aces is, is, I think, awful. Energy is the same, though. That, yeah. That's right. Uh, I, I gave it a 79. I, I did like a, a reset on a bunch of movies for, for 2022 movies. Mm. Um, so this is actually a little higher up there than I think some people may think. Like I dropped a couple things down because I rewatched some things in the car this weekend. Um, but I, 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 I do throw this up there at a 79 out of 100, um, which is – Right along the lines of of Downton Abbey, a new era, and turning red for me in terms of twenty twenty two movies. Abbey, um, I I think the end of this movie is unfortunately there's so much going on that they dump at you that it just is not it it's just not fun anymore at the end, and that's a bummer because the reason this was working is it was fun, uh, and unfortunately this this went from like really good and solid to just very above average, close to good for me. That that that's my my initial thoughts on Bullet Train, Ken Jack. Um, I think for me, the movie is just like frustrating because it is so, and this is like the thing, the first thing I reacted to it with is that there's very clearly a good movie hidden inside it, mm-hmm. but like they knew never get it like realized. It's almost like if you had like the most, the world's most delicious, like Ferro Rocher, like ball of chocolate and it just covered in a thin layer of shit. And it's like, it's right there. It's a piece is right there. Just get rid of the layer of shit. Um, and I think which is like a few changes this really could have been like the action comedy of the year and maybe like of the last like five years, but like they really 
screwed up, I think, in a few areas. And the biggest one, I think, is the casting. Because and it's not because of who they cast, it's because of what the roles that they put them into. Because I don't think you cast Brian Tyree Henry and Joey King into British accented roles when they can't do a British accent, especially next to people who are British. And I, I thought that was a huge waste. And you don't cast someone like Zazie Beats and give her two lines of dialogue. Yeah, that was weird. Yeah, that was bizarre. Crazy. You don't have Michael Shannon have a physically demanding accented role. And I don't think you have one of the best martial artists in Hollywood and Andrew Koji and have him play a pathetic loser who can't fight. And you can. <laughs> And apply that same logic to Karen Fukuhara from The Boys, and the same thing. She's playing like a fucking like like a food person, yeah. an attendant on the train. That's I, crazy. I, I, I thought for a second that was just somebody who looked like her because it was so bas- like she's essentially an extra. Careful, you're not. Yeah, no, you're right. She is like an extra. <laughs> Shut up, dude. <laughs> it, is, it is. She is basically an extra in the movie, which is insane to me. Hiroki and Sonata. Hiroki Sonata also in this movie, by the way. Hiroki Sonata yeah. was very good in this for like the limited time he had. He was like probably the star of the of the later half of it. In the later half of it, I think you cut 25 minutes off this. I thought you were going to say better. that. I actually thought I didn't know you added the glasses too to your your. <laughs> I, I, I was wearing these. Aaron, <laughs> Aaron, Aaron Taylor Johnson and Brian Tyree Henry and and Chris, you can roll off into this. I don't know what you think. I thought you were going to say I thought they dominated too much of the like they were the best part of the movie. So I thought that's the yes. other that's the other part of it, and that I think the characters did work specifically like Pitt was pretty good bad bunny limited screen time crushed it bad bunny was good i was yeah i was kind of happy really crushed it the cameos which we could talk more about later i thought both of them were awesome and lemon and tangerine which is brian tyree henry and aaron tyler johnson or taylor johnson i thought they were really really good definitely a little bit too much screen time but the action awesome hand-to-hand scenes and environmental fights were really cool i think they could have done a better job though specifically with the train of like showing how sort of like tight quarters it is because you watch something like i forget which james bond it was where it was daniel craig versus bautista in the train but that was like a sick train fight was and I expected Spectre? To, that, Spectre, I think it was yeah. Spectre, yeah, which is so it's probably the best part of Spectre, which is not the great. Um, <laughs> but that fight scene was sick. So it's for me just a super frustrating watch because it's it's like watching like I think I explained this to I, I, I used this comparison to Smitty earlier today. So it's like watching like a kid, you like try to put like a like a square peg in a round hole. And it's like it's entertaining to watch that for a little while, but it's like it gets frustrating at a point because you're like the answer's right in front of your face. Just just do it. So like there's like a few little changes that could have made this so good, but it's still like undeniably entertaining, which I think explains the gap between critic and uh, audience score because this is a movie that's meant to be entertaining. It definitely, I think has the sheen of a COVID movie, which is fine. You can't there's not a lot of shit you can do the, uh, the at that point in time when you're filming versus now. Um, so but other than that, what would you give it? I'd give it like I think I'm in a 74. Okay. I'm going to 74 for Bullet Train, uh, but yeah. I, I would give – I actually – the first two-thirds of this movie or three-fourths mm-hmm. before – before the uh, – what the, what's the character's name? I'm, I'm fucking it up. It's the elder. Hiroki Sonata's character yeah. comes in and does like the large exposition yeah. dump and every, you just learn – you learn everything. Like you just learn everything about his character and Michael Shannon's character and you're like, what the fuck? I, I'd have like a, had an 85 at that point. I yeah. loved it. I actually had no issue with anything up. And then it's just like, oh my God, this yeah. is so much yeah. stuff. This is like stuff. They're telling yeah. me things. Chris, thoughts? Um, I'll end up giving it, because my system is different, I'll end up giving it a lower rating, but I'm in agreement with a lot of what you guys are saying. Yeah. Um, the one thing I would disagree with slightly is I actually didn't like the way the movie opened. And a big part of it was, for the first 20 minutes, the movie was just trying so goddamn hard to be cool. I, and, yes. and, <laughs> I would agree with that completely. Yes. And, and I, I also think, well, there is some humor that does actually work quite a bit. There's a fair amount of running gags. And I'm like, ah, this again, just trying to be cute, trying to do these like cutesy little bits of hijinks. It reminded me for a minute of Thor Love and Thunder where it's like, all right, can you just – can you settle down for half a second? Like I was not a fan. The Fuji and I water love bit. Brian Tyree Henry. The whole Thomas the Tank Engine running gag did nothing for me, uh, and they, they beat that into the fucking ground. But that's because um, you use a diesel, bro. Yeah, you're clearly a diesel. I, I, you know, you know, fine. <laughs> yes, I, I probably, definitely am. But uh, I, lo- I really like the cast. Brad Pitt rules in this. I mean, you know, like there's a reason Brad Pitt sustained it the way he has. Like he's like one of the most charismatic actors that has ever existed. Um, Brian Tyree Henry is becoming one of those actors to me that every time I see him in a movie, I'm like, I know this guy's going to be good. Um, the accent's not great. It's better than Joey King's, but his accent yes. was, yeah, it did fade in and out. Um, one thing I found funny is like, man, I just, I know it was a long time ago, but I just remember Aaron Taylor Johnson's kick ass. He guy's built like a tank now. Like, oh, he's nuts. He's I, I, watching this. I'm like, man, he is going to be really good as Craven the Hunter. Like yep. he does. Look, he, he does look like a beast. 
I'm with you guys though in the sense that I was totally down. I'm like, man, this is this is like a seven out of ten. We're almost approaching like eight out of ten territory here. But those last ten minutes, I mean, <laughs> ten people, people might people might not believe me when I say this. I'm actually really willing to suspend disbelief with a lot of movies. Like when you break it down, the John Wick movies. Common and John Wick are having a fucking shootout in the middle of a subway station and nobody notices. Like, I'm willing to, like, accept, hey, it's fiction, it's a movie. But when shit gets stupid, shit gets stupid at the, at the end of the last 10 minutes. Which I would compare uh, Brian Tyree Henry and Brad Pitt fighting in the seat in the quiet car. Like, that. Like I was cool with that. Like, I know it's dumb, yeah, but, like, right. it no, works in the context was, of the jokes. I was with you. It's when... Well, I don't know if we're getting into spoilers, but it's we can. We'll get into spoilers now. Yeah. Okay. It's when there is a massive fucking train accident that would have probably murdered an entire town, that, and yet all the main characters somehow <laughs> survive it. I'm like, all right, now we're now we're getting into ridiculousness territory. I I will say though, I think the movie is aware of its stupidity. Like, I think it yeah. knows it's, it's it's a live action cartoon, but even even that can only be stretched so far. So. Um, you know, I, I 60 and above for me is, is a mild recommendation. I, I don't think there's really any reason to see it in theaters, but I, you know, just slight little thumbs up at like a 63. I think that's like super, I, that's super fair. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, I did. I, I do think that, uh, audiences for the most part will enjoy it. I was kind of worried about the runtime and well, I think a movie called bullet train should maybe be a little bit tighter. <laughs> New movie never really bored me, which I thought it might. So, yeah, it's, it's fine. I, I was never bored of it. And then, Gooch, you can go as well. I, it just, again, I'll reiterate, it just for me, it was so much fun. I liked it. Like, I actually didn't have, like, for, with you, Ken Jack, I thought it mm -hmm. was fitting and working great. It just, when, when you, you halt the, the, not the tone, it wasn't even the tone. When you halt the pace, too many story, I think it was too many storylines. Yeah, yeah. And you <sighs> add, it was just one too many storylines. And that last storyline was just, not that interesting. Because you unraveled basically two big storylines at the yes. end. It was one storyline, but it was like two exposition story dumps. And it kind of halted because you picked up a pace the whole way. Yeah. And you had a steam. And you and it's honestly, it's funny. It's on a train. It literally had that momentum where it was mm -hmm. going, going, going. And then it just kind of threw you off course a bit. You're like, this is this is too much stuff. You could dump Sonata and just keep Andrew Koji as the guy trying to get revenge for his dad or whatever. Like, and you just lose yeah. all you lose 20 minutes of time right there. And I think and you could have had her again, Andrew Koji actually be able to demonstrate his yes. insane worth as a martial artist and fight fight person. So I don't know. That's just very frustrating in I, retrospect. I, I, I love Michael Shannon. He's a he's a Kentucky guy, Lexington guy. Uh, he was miscast. Big time. Terrible. Yeah, totally. Goodness. Big time. He took me so far out of that movie uh, towards the end. I, I agree with what you guys are saying. It's a very fun movie. I mean, it's like the textbook TNT, like catch it on a Sunday. Oh, watch totally. it. Yeah. yeah, like it's it's good. You can flip it on at any point. I don't think you'll be lost at all. You just have fun with it. Uh, I come in at a 75 and I agree with what most most of most of what you guys said. Uh, the accents. I think I'm accent blind. I am, too. That's why I haven't commented on it, because uh, I don't I don't I, I just I don't get it. It didn't notice. I didn't notice it at all. When Brian Tyree Henry me. like yelled was, or got agitated, his accent disappeared. He I, became American. I thought it was going to bother me because I talked to Ken Jack before seeing it. And he said the accents were, were pretty, me, pretty bad. Meanwhile, I actually Googled. I re looked up if he was British. <laughs> I, I swear to God, I was like, I was like, wait, he's not he's not British. right? Yeah, I just I'll never I actually look up. Joey King was British. For yeah, a second. I thought Joey King was British. I'm not even going to lie. She, she definitely she has is a not. British she had, face. She had like three months of accent work for a British accent, and the British accent wasn't very good. Um, I thought I thought her character was really cool up until the end, actually. Yeah. Uh, like yeah. she seemed like she was the one in control of the whole train. It was interesting. I actually liked the water bottle bit too. <laughs> um, that definitely but, drove uh, Chris. Oh, you did. So I was gonna say I thought that would be a gag you would have hated out of this. No, that one. I, well, because it, it it was woven really well into the okay. story. Yeah, it, it uh, set so, it. Yeah. It was the joke was set up well because they had yeah. done that same bit with like every single character, and then the fucking water bottle gets one. Um, yeah. yeah. But then you get one more with Tanada. Um, mm -hmm. So yeah, seventy five for me. Fun movie. Uh, I don't think it really tries to reinvent the wheel in any way. It's just like here's a bunch of really talented, funny people, and we're just gonna have them do gags for two hours on a train. Probably should have been ninety minutes. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Would have fixed a lot of things. Probably would have come in at like high 80s if they did that. That See, that's – you kind of just nailed it, I feel like. It, it's a lot of talented, funny, well, gr like really good actors coming together. Yeah. And it's I, – I just think when you overcomplicate it at the end like that, that, that kind of defeats what you've put together. Yeah. Should have just been like a little dumb, fun movie. And it still kind of was, but – 
just that extra bit at the end just really, really took me. I was checking my yeah. phone. There's just once so, I start checking my yeah. phone, see like how much time I'm like, holy shit. There's just so many little ways they explain the Michael, you know, the white death character and like how it connects and everything. And you know, I will say my favorite movie of all time, Ocean's Eleven. I'll always say when you want to do the Ocean's Eleven, the idea of the twist of Ocean's Eleven is complicated, but not. And I'll, you, hey, throw Logan Lucky in there as well. Mm-hmm. Very like very similar thing. Just Ocean's Seven Eleven as they call yes. it. It, it is complicated, but it really isn't because when they explain it, it is super easy to follow. Like you you are unraveling a lot of shit at the end of the movie and it doesn't miss a beat. It doesn't stop in its tracks to explain it to you. And now this is – it's kind of a twist movie I guess in a sense. Not really, but like they yeah. are they are explaining like the backstory of why yeah. they're all there, right? Yes. I, when it becomes too much and it does halt your movie – that that's where the problem is. That's why I, like, that is again why I always credit like Soderbergh with like Ocean's Eleven and Logan Lucky. They have, in a sense, mildly complicated like backstories that they're explaining to you. Like, oh, this is really what Channing Tatum. This is really what Brad Pitt and George Clooney did. But mm-hmm. they do it in such a snappy, quick way, and it's easy to follow, and it doesn't kind of halt the movie a little bit. And yeah. these just kind of halted the movie for me. Just I think you got to embrace being an action comedy and just shave, make it an, it has to be an hour and a half movie. It has to be an hour and a half yeah. movie, jokes, action, jokes, action, jokes, action. And like when you look at Atomic Blonde, like it's almost that minus all of the comedy. And like that's where like David Lech, Lech, I mean, that's it's got to be, Leech. I think it's Leech. Leech? I thought, I thought it was Leech. Leech. Leitch? Is it Leitch? I like Leitch. Leitch or Leitch? I like Leitch. We just said it in the interview with <laughs> yeah. J.J. Perry, by the way. The, so um, however he said it is how you say it. Exactly. Um, but I think when you look at him and he, if he's like a more laser focused on the action, he's significantly better. I don't think his sort of like uh, dialogue scenes worked as well. And I was actually talking to Justin Kroll about this, who's a buddy of ours over at Deadline. Like he said the same thing. He's like, I, you just can't have a guy like that heavily invested in dialogue versus action because he's so talented at action. And just okay at dialogue. And I think that kind of hurt a little bit. You could have just had it more almost like Deadpool-y where it's like very quick and like um like tiny little bits of comedy versus it being having to be a big dialogue moment. So. Also, Kidrick, you said you like the cameos. Did did you guys like the cameos? I love I like Channing Tatum specifically a lot. The Ron Reynolds one was pretty dumb. That one that one <laughs> took me out of it for a second. And I guess I, Sandra Bullock was technically a cameo, but like they spoiled in it the and they, they spoiled yeah. it in the trailers. Yeah. But I think she was I, um, written as a I, cameo. I, I like the Channing Tatum one. I don't like cameos with the exception of Brad Pitt in Deadpool 2, ironically. Yeah. But I don't like cameos that are just, it's that guy. Like, yeah, I yeah. thought, I, you know what I thought when they showed him? Like, they had a, gave him a big introduction. I thought that he was going to come back around and be like a be so did I. Yeah. movie. So I'm did like, I. Oh, that's dope. Um, the fact that they just showed his face, I'm like, okay, well, that's just a, all it is. is that's Ryan Reynolds returning the favor for Brad Pitt being in Deadpool 2. That's yeah. all it was. Yeah, yeah, I, yeah. I I did. You mean Tatum Rock? No, though. you mean Lost City of D. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Channing, I think that's how that happened. Yeah. Channing Tatum, the Channing Tatum one, I did chuckle at when he the sex stuff. He's when, like, "Is this a sex thing?" Yeah. yeah when when he, cool. um, are we doing the sex stuff his, now? His comedic chops are so when they good. were buying the food or whatever. Yeah. When they're yeah. buying off like the cart. Yeah. When Aaron Taylor and Johnson and Brad Pitt were buying food off like yeah. the drink cart or whatever, and he's like, "I don't have any. Can you pay for it? I don't have any yeah, money?" I, that gave, was I gave it to the guy who wore my hat and glasses. Yeah. I thought that was a nice little callback. It was again. That's that's a tough thing for me. I. I didn't fully read the reviews. I just knew what the Rotten Tomato score was, which I've been trying to do more and more lately. And as I'm watching it, I just knew what the score is. And I'm like, what's about to happen? Something bad's about that. Yeah. <laughs> why, why don't why don't people because I really enjoyed it. I'm like, man, why don't why don't critics like this movie? And then it just became very like Apparent, hefty. Yes. Like mm-hmm. just, just stuff. Just like they just barf small, stuff at you at the small end. Small adjustments to this movie, man. It could have been one of the best of the last few years as far as again, just action In comedy that, yeah. goes. But for me, no, now it stands one point behind. I want to see Aaron Taylor Johnson more stuff Abby. now. I think he kind of stole he the rocks. show. You should, if you've ever seen yeah. Outlaw King, this dude can fucking act. He is really good. I remember when we talked about who we'd want to play Wolverine, I said him A number one because him in Outlaw King is insane. So, I mean, well, he's yeah. clearly a little big for the role. I don't know. I mean, he's he's Jackman tall. is that big too. Yeah, like, he, he was good in H. another Michael Shannon movie. I mean, Nocturnal Animals. Oh, yeah. Uh, you want to go yeah. a globe, a shocking globe. Remember, we talked about that. It was, it was a globe that like yeah. – he didn't even get nominated for, I think, the Oscars. I, think. I thought you were going to say I Tenet for a second. That. I was like, I don't remember Michael Shannon in Tenet. Um, I almost forget that Aaron Taylor Johnson. Taylor Johnson's in it. I like, I like, I, I, I grew fonder of Nocturnal Animals as time went on. Mm, good movie. I'm also super biased about anything with Jake Gyllenhaal, so that could also be the case. Do you remember that guy? And I don't know if we got a chance to talk about this. The guy who described Derek Carr as. Jake Gyllenhaal, did you see that tweet? Yes. yes. Yeah. What a fucking moron. Bad comparison. What a moron. He's like, yeah, he's got that everyman quality. Yes. Who the fuck considers Jake Gyllenhaal an everyman actor? Are you, are you, are you the biggest moron on earth? <laughs> Not Outrageously actor, disrespectful yeah. to Jake Gyllenhaal. 
Oh, I hated that guy so much. Um, <laughs> so that is Bullet Train. I uh, ranging. I would it lands in the mid uh, low to mid seventies for us yeah. as as a group. Um, which I'm gonna be honest, that's disappointing because I would bullet the Bullet Train trailer came out. I was like this could be fucking. It amazing. was one of mm-hmm. you or Chris's most anticipated of the year. I remember I went back. The and first looked trailer at was, was great. Like yeah. oh, fuck, I forget who's it on. Like my anticipated the list, by the way. Uh, I had like Top Gun, Maverick, and I had I think a bench. You had Banshees of Inisherin on. Yeah, yeah, I definitely have it on mine. But I think one of you had Bullet Train pretty high. I th- think it was Jeff, but yeah, I might was have. That the, was that the anticipated movies? That was the draft we did, right? Yeah, we yeah, did the draft. I don't. I might I have. Yeah. I Let's see. Know. You had Chris um, Avatar two pending, right. Wakanda, Wakanda Forever pending, and Bullet Train. Which oh, okay, okay. okay, and then the Northman, and then Elvis. So I think things kind of panned out for you. Fuck uh, yeah, fuck yeah, Elvis. You had Thor: Love and Thunder first over, or second overall, Jeff. Uh, Unbearable weight of f- massive talent, Creed three, Don't Worry, Darling, and Super Mario with Chris Pratt. Don't worry, Darling, which apparently isn't being promoted by Florence Pugh <laughs> because she was upset with the affair that Olivia Wilde had with set. Harry Styles. I, 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 that's I also, a wild rumor. I also picked Elvis like as a joke because I thought it was gonna suck. So I'm kind of mm. I can't really count that one. Yeah, uh, I mean, all I, of our last ones were I, kind of. You I had Minions, did, Robbie. On Peacock, I did no, watch uh, Robbie Fox. Oh, it was Robbie Fox. Gotcha. Yeah, I did. I did watch the second worst movie I've seen this year on Peacock this weekend. Oh, God, I uh, they them. They oh. no no. They slash. Them. They slash. They them. slash them. Yeah. Uh, oh, it's a slasher. Four out of a hundred. That bad? It's Kevin Bacon un- banger. It's right? unbelievably bad. Interesting. Like I, unreal. If you're bad. looking for a slasher to go watch, I don't know if we're going to review it on the pod. Bodies, bodies, bodies. Yeah. It goes wide this week. I have. I was. It was really, really. It wasn't good. playing where I was this weekend. I really want to see it. It I, was I, so funny. Everyone says it's it's great. So Ugh. funny. It's one of the funnier movies I've seen like last couple of years. Like it's, mm. it's 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 good movie. Can't they wait. they them they them man. <laughs> They slash them. They slash them. Second worst of the year. I had a I just. Mean, that's like one of those things where you know they they like somebody thought of the title. And they had like, what if we made a slasher called yeah. They Slash Them? And then they just like that. That was. They did nothing else. <laughs> Average score of movies this year for me is a fifty-eight. Dan, right why now. you give it? Why you give every movie a ninety? <laughs> why is every movie a ninety plus? That, that some guy on Twitter got so mad at me and Ken. Like everything's good. He's like, yeah, I want to see you the mean- bad ones. Yours a fifty-seven. There you go. Yeah. Yeah. See. Average. Yeah. I had Babylon, by the we way. We actually did, though, the day after we did release a movie that we you did post a movie that had like a score you in the 70s. Master of Disi- you had Master of Disguise. Right? Oh, yeah. 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 Post Master of Disguise. Literal zero. zero. We posted the Master of Disguise. And if you ha- if you don't follow us on Twitter, because I know some people don't on Twitter, we do a, a moving graphic. So it starts at a the zero goes up. and it counts up to 100. And somebody replied, Master of we both had it at a zero. Somebody yeah. replied, like, I was just staring at this, waiting for the number to go up and it never <laughs> went up. Never moved. <laughs> Hard it zero. deserves a five. I laughed. I laughed when I was a, f- a kid. A five just for reading the trivia about 9-11 with it. With yeah, the- I was just going to say that's yeah. mo- five for the moment of silence. Yep. The moment of silence in the turtle suit. Oh, my God, Dana Carvey. What were you doing? <laughs> Am I not turtly enough? <sighs> yeah, we're in the turtle club. You're not a member of the turtle club. That was a funny tweet. I saw responding to that. Um, second. Prey is the next movie we're going to talk about. Uh, it's on Hulu, not in theaters. Oh. Uh, it is another movie in the Predator cinematic universe, which is ninety percent shit. Uh, mm. Yeah, I like, I like the the subway commercials. It's it's a matter of do, do you. <laughs> that's good. That's good. That took a second, but yeah, that's a good one. <laughs> Remember, we were gonna give. We were gonna. Why that's so funny to me? We were gonna give um, Jesse Eisenberg. I wanted to give him a trophy that said Indiana, Indiana of the year mm-hmm. or Hoosier of the year, Hoosier of the year. Yeah, yeah. And we we're going to give him a trophy and it was going to have just Jared Fogel's name crossed, crossed out, out a of bunch it, of times. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we never did that. Yeah. Uh, Pre- Prey, which is a prequel to Predator. Uh, it is the funniest, which I didn't think about this till I watched the review from um chris stockman did a review on this and i didn't even think about this that the, the movie titles for predator are just absurd yeah. predator predator 2 predators the predator and now prey mm-hmm. i'll be honest this is the second predator movie i've seen i've had no really i've, I've never really predator 2 is, is not good. my third predator 2 is is, su- is such a wild contrast to predator it's so bad um I don't despise predator 2 i don't like hate it predators i i yeah and then the predator um we a- reviewed wait, on this podcast. Even, you didn't even mention AVP or AVP. I'm too. not included. The well, they don't include those in the universe. Those have to be part of the universe. It's got the predator in it. They don't include those in the universe. Is it included in the alien verse? Yes, it has to be both. It's, it's crossover. something. It's something like that. There's a weird way. 
The reason that we they, include it on our site because it's part yeah. of the movie, but I, I they don't consider it part of that franchise. The reason they even did that is because in Predator Two, they made like when they go to the the Predator ship, like one of the skulls they have is an alien skull because I think the guy who did right. the creature design for both, like he's like, I'll just throw one of these in, and they're like, okay, let's just make a movie out of it. Well, I think I, that rocks. I, I, I okay, it, I maybe it became a comic series after that too, didn't it? I think so. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Predator Two is is, and let, let me be clear, it's really bad. But I actually don't – like it's a, for me, it's a so bad it's enjoyable and good because it's so yeah. ridiculous. But it is really bad. I'd be shocked if I had it rated anything above a 30. Mm -hmm. What's his name? Like uh, Arnie just like, like was like, I'm not going to do it. I'm not doing anything that's like a, a sequel to Predator where we're just like – basically, I think the original script had Dutch turning into the villain of the movie. I and mean, like he like you'd be fighting against him and the predator. And he's like, why the fuck would I ever do that? And they're uh, like, okay, we'll just do Danny Glover. Uh, yeah, Danny Glover. That's such a good example of sometimes older camp, like not even mm -hmm. camp, like stupid movies like that, are worse movies, but more enjoyable. And I'm uh, yes, I was gonna say, Predators and the Predator mm -hmm. probably better movies in terms of what's being made. But if you had to tell me to watch one of those two or Predator yeah. two, I'd watch Predator two a hundred out of hundred times, which actually has a massive reference in this movie. Yeah, that's true. Massive it's, it's Predator Two reference in this movie. Yeah, I missed it. I don't, yeah, I don't you, know. yeah. Uh, we'll get it. We'll do it in spoilers just in case you're a big Predator fan. Um, so yeah, this is a prequel to uh, 1987's Predator. Uh, a skilled Comanche warrior protects set 300 years ago in the 17, early 1700s. Uh, protects her tribe from a highly evolved alien predator that hunts humans for sport, fighting against wilderness dangerous uh colonizers and this mysterious creature to keep her people safe uh again released on hulu i actually don't know if this was ever intended to be released in theaters it should have been it was a great was it? a great theater experience this is a movie i wish i would have seen in theaters exactly <laughs> put it that way uh pretty bomb betting at these in theaters uh this was being developed during the production of the predator in 2018 uh oh. came over to disney when disney bought fox uh yeah, and then it got released on Hulu. Um, director uh, Dan Trachtenberg, who did 10 Cloverfield Lane, uh, which I love. I love 10 Cloverfield yeah. Lane. Mm -hmm. I think that's an awesome movie. Um, also did some stuff with the Black Mirror as well, but this is his second directorial job. Uh, <laughs> his, his fucking Wikipedia is hilarious. His personal life. Trachtenberg had a bar mitzvah. Uh, and nice. then he is not related to actress Michelle Trachtenberg. That's, I mean, that's I've never seen know. that in a that, Wikipedia where they're like not related to. I, I actually do like that because there's a lot of times where I'll look up and be like, is this person related to this? Person? So much you do with the Will Smith. Euro trip? Yeah. Is that, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so much you do with the Will Smith Wikipedia. Yeah. List every Smith that isn't related to Will Smith in his Wikipedia who he is not related to. <laughs> not related like, to Kevin Smith. Please. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, so, yeah, this is Prey. Uh, it is picking up a lot of steam. Um. I don't know how to say her name exactly. Amber Mid Thunder. Mid Thunder. Mid -thunder? Yeah. yeah. Great name, name, by the way. Yeah, she was on Legion. She plays uh Naru, who is the young female protagonist in this movie. Uh, we will we will talk about a tweet that we saw. Go woke, go broke. Uh a lot of people exposing themselves on social media. This is I don't want that to be the main part of the review because the movie's too good to do that. Yeah. yeah. But we will talk about that. There there are a lot of people exposing themselves as either not having really seen Predator. Or not understanding Predator, or not which I'm, Prey. I'm not sure which is more embarrassing. Like, or if, just not having watched the fucking. If movie. you haven't seen Predator, that's not embarrassing. But to cape for a movie you haven't seen yeah. is very weird. Uh, there's also underneath yeah. the tweet, there's someone who admitted to not even having seen this movie. Yeah, that's yeah. Like, no, what that's, are you doing here? That happens a lot. Uh, but Prey, <laughs> very unsuspectingly awesome movie. Uh, I oddly am not high on it maybe as some people but i still really liked it uh it lands for me uh at an 82 out of 100 i really enjoyed it um below uh, below the elvises of the world for those who are wondering also marcel the shell with shoes on oh yeah that's okay i'll talk shout about out that to, later. shout out to marcel uh vengeance which i saw by the way which i really liked yeah vengeance i knew you'd like awesome. that with really, multiple scenes in a water burger i really like <laughs> vengeance is awesome uh pray i have it in 82 um there were some things in the middle i didn't particularly love i will say that but yeah. easily the second best predator movie without a doubt um just stripped down raw simple and terrifying for what the predator should be like like really just got everything right there again i don't I am maybe not as high as some people are. This is very high up there for a lot of people, um, but easily the second best Predator movie. I really had a great time with this, and I, I, 
I said this to somebody this morning. I honestly, I need to watch it again. I kind of think seeing it in theaters, I would have liked it a little more as well. I hated that I had to watch this yeah. mm-hmm. on my TV. There are a couple moments that were clearly made for a big scene. Oh, yeah, big time. Yeah. Like a couple shots that was like, well, this this was the- definitely shot. A big screen. The whole line. third act. The whole third act was yeah. meant for a big. Yeah, twice I, I I still really liked it. Eighty two out of hundred. I really enjoyed Prey. Uh, not as good as the first one, maybe, but still really awesome. Uh, just a bummer that it was on fucking Hulu. Mm. What a what a sh- oh by the way, I might rewind for a second. Maybe maybe next time Discovery Plus is an earnings call or Discovery Warner Bros. Maybe be like, hey, we now allow you to rewind HBO Max without having to restart the fucking yeah, the entire movie. Yeah, that'd be nice. Um, Ken Jack. Um, so I think the, the first thing I came away from this movie with is just that like the reason this movie is so good is because it's the first Predator movie to realize what Predator, what Predator did that was so special. And to me, that's just simplicity. It's just so, it's so easy. It's just simplicity. The plot of the movie is as basic as possible with as little subplot shit as possible. And I just think like the Predator versus Prey with the Prey having improvised, trained and out with the Predator. That is the simplest formula for a Predator movie and sim- somehow no movie since the original has been able to figure that out. And I think for this movie, this on the story end of things anyway, I just I really like how they went back to basics because it's like a throwback in itself to Predator, the, the 1987 one. Because in that movie, the Predator is like, his whole thing is he's perfectly adapted to counter human technology and weapons and stuff, right? And to beat that, Arnie has to go back to basics, like human basics, like spears, bows, arrows, traps, and all that shit. And that's what they do in this movie. That's how they defeat the Predator in this movie. And I think, like, it, it kind of parallels to the sort of Predators, like, by using those, like, French trappers that they use in the movie. Because, like, they're murdering all those bison for sport, taking trophies and all that shit. And, like, that disgusts our main character and, like, all the Comanches in general. Like, they're all like, this is disgusting behavior. Like, why would anyone do that? I like how they they sort of, par- like, not parodied, but paralleled it. Um, and lastly, the, the action, so good. I think there's really great shots, cool weapons, and the Predator was badass as fuck. Like, mm-hmm. he just looks so scary. And they, like, they I think they did a perfect sort of like de-leveling or retrograding of his technology from like the plasma caster thing to like the little yes. um, uh, needles or whatever. And I think the, the, one of the biggest takeaways for me too is just this was very surprising, like surprisingly great because when I watched the trailer, I would have bet anything that this was going to be terrible because they presented it like, hey, here's a female empowerment movie where the character has to say out loud multiple times, I'm a girl, but I can do what guys do. And like, I hate that shit because yeah. it's like, yeah, we know that. You don't need characters to say it. Just have them do it and let the audience take that away themselves. But that is like so that sort of unsubtle messaging and all that other shit is so annoying. But they don't it's not present really in this movie, which is great. And I think that benefited the movie a ton. Really liked a lot of the characters in it. Um, uh, Mid Thunder was like, okay, but I don't think like the actors were they're more of a vessel for action than they are trying to like present like some crazy acting case. Um, Dakota Beavers, who is the older brother, I thought was really good in like limited screen time. Um, You think that's funny name Dakota Beavers? I just think, yes, I, I just think it pussy I, I, with beavers. Yeah. So unbelievable. Um, he's good in the movie. He's good in the movie. But yeah. he's good in the movie. Um, I think the the way that they sort of shot a lot of the action with like the still cameras, not a lot of shaky cam, a lot of like going over the shoulder for these crazy moves and shit. Cool. They they act on the string. Really cool. Um, in the way that the predators tech, like using the shield as like a as like a weapon, like an offensive weapon. I thought it really awesome as well. Really, really enjoyed this movie. Like Jeff was saying, easily the best predator movie since the original by far. Yeah, for me again, like it was some of the stuff in the middle, but a lot of it was kind of acting scripts, which is, which is tough because mm-hmm. I do think they were going for it to be good in that sense, yeah. right? Like I don't think this was like a full on like, hey, this is gonna be like we just said it about Bullet Train, right? Like Bullet Train had a self aware like ridiculousness. Yeah. I don't like yeah. this. It, it felt not amateurish, but like a little took itself too seriously at points. Yeah, where where. Which is fine, which I like that they did that, but I just don't think acting script wise it kept up with that. Yeah. She, again, though, she was great. Nar, she was like the physical stuff, all the physical and visual stuff in the movie was fucking fantastic. Yeah. I will note that. Chris, I really like this. Yeah, I, I'm with you guys. I think uh, this, uh, Dan Trachenberg's two for two uh, as far as I'm concerned. Yeah, uh, I'm very very excited to see where he goes from here. Um, you know, the the one thing this movie does that the, the original did as well too is just like. And you guys have already talked about it. I don't want to cover it too much. But the Predator is just such a badass-looking character. Like, maybe the the single most well-designed film antagonist ever. And he's so creepy in this. And what I appreciate about this film, especially in the modern age where everything has to be big, explosions have to be bigger, movies need to be louder, there's a 
fair amount of subtlety to this, especially in the first act where you don't really see the predator until the second act of the movie. I mean, you see him kind of in shadow for, for a little bit. And obviously you see him when he's, when he's invisible, but um, yeah, it's got tremendous action. I mean, just badass action. It just goes to show like when it comes to action, I think budget is almost irrelevant. Like if you, if you know what you're doing and you can film an action sequence and you know, you know where to put the camera, uh, it doesn't matter if a movie costs 20 million or 200 million, you can make it look good. Uh, the complaints I have are some of the complaints you guys brought up, which is that um, the acting outside of the main character at points, a little bit so-so, you know, I thought kind of the rest of the tribe was a little bit, was a little bit wooden at points. Um, I'm, I'm willing to forgive this part because you don't have a ton, but there's not a lot of, some of the CG is pretty wonky. The Predator looks great, but there's, you know, there's a bear and there's there's some stuff that. that The bear is a little tough. Yeah. Great, great mask. The mask was so cool. I did did love when he just punched the, just punched the bear square in the jaw. That's what I love about the Predator, man. It's just like. so fucking awesome. and, And this movie as a whole is it actually has some balls like. Just openly, I know they're CG, but just like viciously murders animals yeah. multiple times in this movie. It's like oh. that, that reminds me of that era of filmmaking where they just kind of didn't give a fuck and just made violent shit for the sake of violent mm-hmm. shit. But the big, the one big complaint I have is that the original Predator, what makes it so good is that those characters are really funny. Like they have some actual, some really good dial, like punch up dialogue here. While I appreciate the movie's subtlety. I could have used a little bit more personality from the characters to sure. really get you invested, to really get you ca- to care. I'm not saying I'm asking for Marvel quippiness. And I appreciate the fact that the movie took itself seriously, but there are a few moments where it, it feels a little bit dry. But every time I felt that way, something insanely awesome would happen. I would me- immediately forget about like the, the complaints I had because the predator was, was so badass in it. So, um, yeah, it, in even 80, the same, because I, I'm not sure if I like it more than Nope, but I gave Nope in, in 80. So I'm going to uh, give this an 80 as well. And uh, for all my complaining, this has been a pretty good summer for movies. This is like yeah. the fourth or fifth movie that it's been I solid. Seen. Yeah, where I was like, yeah, this is this is a good movie. Yeah, so uh, good stuff. One of the bigger surprises of the year, for you, sure. You reminded me, I forgot to mention, The Dog was awesome. Great dog. Oh, yes. Great dog movie dog. Right I will there. say that that get that had so much anxiety. Yeah, the dog. I was like, the dog, the to dog is gonna die, isn't he? <laughs> I was like, if they kill his dog, I'm gonna give this movie. Well, I mean, zero. so it is kind of funny. Like, we, that's now two movies in a row, or two out of the last three weeks. We've had a movie that were, that were like, the idea of a predator is so yeah. prevalent. Yeah, like between this and Nope, yeah. and like yeah. taming a predator and taming the beast, and like like yeah. ranking in the food chain and everything, and it's one of those odd. Uh, surprise of the year for me because I didn't even know this existed until a couple weeks ago. Mm-hmm. So that's just a surprise that it even is the thing that it they got released. Didn't drop a trailer until like a month ago. <laughs> yeah. Um, just, yeah. So, yeah. I mean. Uh, what do you think? Yeah, I'm right there with you. I am I think it's almost as good as the original. I watched the original about two weeks ago for the first time in probably 12 years. Um, yeah, no. It, it, one thing that did kind of confuse me, the the English dialogue from the tribe instead of making the decision to use Comanche speech was kind of strange because it's like they're speaking kind of like they sound like they're from L.A. <laughs> I mean, at points, they sound <laughs> like they're from L.A. And it just like yeah. kind of takes me out. Uh, this might have been a setting on my TV or my, I guess, Hulu. But when they're speaking French, did do you guys get English subtitles? Uh, no, I got I French ones and I kind of wanted to know what they were saying because um, I didn't understand shit. Uh, but I outside thought that was that, just because I watched it on the screener. I thought that was just like an issue with the screener. Yeah, no, that was on Hulu too. That's crazy. Um, so that uh, that was a weird decision to me. Uh, but outside of that, yeah, no, everything you guys say, I kind of echo. The action was fucking awesome. Uh, when he was chopping off people's arms, <laughs> um, that was so cool. And their limbs and like just chopped off their legs and he just fell down to the ground. Yeah, I, mm-hmm. I love that. Um, the reviews are kind of wild online you get everything from people saying like they love it like high 90s like second best or yeah some people have been their top three of the year like yep. legitimate reviewers and then you get other people that are like haven't even seen the movie hate it uh i saw one review that They're gave it half a star because of too much animal violence <laughs> too much violence <laughs> okay. against animals okay. frank Peta uh-huh. didn't like it yeah i mean kind of <laughs> Peta malark actually i guess would have been the better joke there damn uh, but yeah, all in all, great, a great surprise. This is what I wish more streaming movies were. Uh, I, I do mm-hmm. wish the movie was on the big screen, but if that's the tough if thing, a movie like, is exactly. going to be on streaming. If you're going to run with these like 40 to $60 million budget movies, and that's mm-hmm. usually the range they go for, for these streaming films. 
this is what they should be. This is what it should. Look if this like. is really good, is it because the seat would the sequel be in theaters? Like that'd be kind of that's weird, so yeah. uh, to be so yeah. wild. I don't think they do. I think this didn't set up a sequel at all. Oh, you know what Kroll said, which it, was very cool. The post credits it did. Yeah, uh, fuck, there was a post credit. Uh kind of. It was like in the. It was like I, in like the cave paintings. Kevin cool. Feige, you've ruined movies for me. I'm not, Kroll brought it up um, on Twitter today. He's like, "What if they just went back in time and had predators like killing a group of people where you want the predator to win? So like it's him versus Nazis or something." See, yeah, like, no, I would I, love the fuck. I, out I of think. That. What are, what are Predator 2 and the other Predator? Predator 2 is in the 90s, but it's set in futuristic 90s because they filmed it like 1990. See, I, would, set in I, I agree I with you. I'd love to see just Predator against different groups. Like, yeah, have, it, have them like, like World's Deadliest knights. Warrior. Like, yeah, literally like just... do knights, do uh, you can do Vikings, you can do do spikes, pirates, samurai, like do samurai. fucking sp spikes, deadliest warrior. Why not? And just have them go back in time and fight all these guys. Have them fighting like Maoris, have them fighting like fucking like literally anything. Like, it's be, I would watch the shit out of any of those. You gotta watch Predator too, because you'll get you'll get your different environments and to. settings on that one. <laughs> L.A. baby, it's it's the Predator versus Jamaican and Colombian drug lords, uh, and also Danny Glover, who's the one good cop in L.A. He gets right? so here's spoiler alert: Predator goes to Broadway. He yeah, kills still. the Predator at the end of the movie, <laughs> and he is gifted the gun. Yeah, that we see in this movie. And then like the gun with the inscription on it or whatever, the, uh, the okay. pistol, which actually that does set up that sets something up because if they have the, I was wondering about that because the gun now has to get into the hands of the predator. So yeah. there is that is like that is more than even more than the post credit. That is a bit of a nod and a setup. Yeah, I, I love yeah. I think it, it it emulates. I like that they didn't fully just try to redo like when she was in the mud. It's, you kind of like, yeah, all right. Yeah, I like I that. It was more was of a like, nod. Yeah. yeah. Right. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's it's and this is there was a tweet. A really fucking stupid tweet. We'll make fun of this idiot. It's a absolute... graphic with a graphic. That's so yeah, yeah, with, with, with a, a moron. With a with... graphic that was probably made, let's be honest, like two months ago. Yeah. Yeah. Once he saw that the movie was getting made, he probably made that graphic. Women that killing day. a predator? He did vomit emoji, hashtag prey movie, which I'm glad he used. He used the 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 mark movie marketing's uh, hashtag, yeah. Yeah. hashtag <laughs> emoji. Uh, it shows the cast of the pre of predators as a team of highly skilled badasses with years of experience and almost no chance versus a predator. And then bottom says a girl with almost no experience beats a predator alone. But like that's not what happened. That's like you just don't. You, you didn't. I don't know if you didn't watch. I actually think this person watched Prey, or but they couldn't have because they said she beat it alone. There was like fifty people fighting that's the predator true. at one point. That's true. But I'm more alarmed. That this person's caping for the original Predator and very clearly doesn't know how the pre like, like I mean it's just Arnold mm. like he was he, the Predator was beat alone by somebody who had to use yeah, he mud had to use native technology he had to use go back to basics and had had to get rid of like the whole point is the Predator is the crazier being and you can't use the guns and the weapons and like because he's perfectly capable he's countered that as technology one ugly motherfucker. It. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you should see what he says in fucking Predator too. He's like, shit happens. He says all. <laughs> he has like fifty phrases. The Predator. He's a real cut up. It's crazy. Like, it's and so the, the the big first reply if you go to the tweets is like, someone said, didn't the last surviving badass only turn the tables in the Predator when he turned to Stone Age tactics? Like, yeah. It, it, that's why this movie is awesome. Like, it it really played into what we like about the original Predator movie. It just, exactly. <laughs> but that guy went around just getting dunked on left and right. People were like, you fucking idiot. Deserved it. You you fucking I, thank moron. God he did tag the, or hashtag the movie because we would have never found it otherwise. It helped his SEO to yeah. get dunked on. Yeah, good thing. Good thing you, you they used to be called the hash flag by the way. A hash flag. because when they, they debuted those, they de debuted yeah. them during I believe the World Cup, and you would you would do. That's actually my favorite when the World Cup and the Olympics happen mm -hmm. and they cross over, which is just going to happen in the fall. It's going to cross over with the World Cup. Is when you do like certain countries. It's really like certain college football teams. Yeah, like abbreviations yeah like during the olympics like it was like you do uga for like georgia but it's really uganda so like you've all you have like the, you have the georgia yeah. football account tweeting about like spring pra or like summer practice and yeah, everything qualifying and runs. recruiting it has a ugandan flag all over their twitter page yeah was that was that the 2010 world cup that they did the, that with i would imagine yeah yeah 2010 yeah. yep that's when they first yeah. did it could have been south africa right yeah. i mean the usa right. is is hoisting the trophy this year i'm very hyped about them right now if you don't think the usa is winning the world cup you're a you're a fool bring it home <laughs> you're you're bringing it that home, was yeah. uh, uh the oakland athletics whenever the olympics happen if they do hashtag athletics it's just the athletics icon for the yeah. olympics the other one is um puerto rico ecuador for ecu shout out to ecu if you listen you go to sup dogs so it's called right yeah that's their big bar yep. it's their big bar that's why uh, mr beast used to go there did he really mr beast crossed 100 million subscribers and gave an island away to somebody that's disgusting i like mr beast 
I love Mr. Beast. Have you been watching what we do in the shadows? Yes. There's, did you see, did you hear that Mr. Beast joke? Last no, I made I a Mr. Beast that joke. Oh, the last yeah, like yet. one of the one of the main characters got turned into a kid, and he like acts like a kid, so he carries his iPad around, and he just annoy the shit out of people. He's like. Have you ever seen Mr. Beast? <laughs> <laughs> I love that. He, Young Con is he, very funny. He did a challenge he gave up on. Um, he did a challenge where he wasn't he was gonna fast for 30 days. He wasn't gonna eat any food, only water. But in the in the middle of the process, he he recreated uh Willy Wonka's chocolate factory. Yeah. So he can't eat any food. And then he went there and then Gordon Ramsay showed up to cook. And he's like, fuck this. I just gotta eat this food. Mm. I, I'm a, I'm a massive pro Mr. Beast guy. He does nothing wrong. He's he's a he's a great he's a cool dude. He gives away money. This, this surely won't backfire. <laughs> yeah, I like Miss No Mister. I'm pro Mister Beast. He's a barstool guy too. He he oh, like yeah, went up to right. he went up to our our it's, band Pop Punk, and he said to like Roan. He was not huge at the time. He was getting uh, there was definitely. Like, he was there this weekend. <laughs> no, a couple years ago in in uh, wherever ECU is North Carolina. North Carolina, yeah, yeah. And he went up to I guess Roan or somebody. Say, hey, man, like big fan Mister Beast, and I guess Roan on stage goes. He's like Sir Beast or something. He's like, <laughs> wrong on stage, and now he's like the biggest fucking thing on YouTube. Yeah, um, shout out him making Squid Games a reality. Everyone yeah, that one was exactly and then Netflix just was like, "Oh, we'll do that, but yeah. it, it won't be wholesome. It won't be fun whatsoever." Yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, anyway, that's that's Prey. Good. The movies were good this week. Movies be, yeah. be good. Yeah. Watch Predator Two. It's on Hulu. Maybe. Come on, if you want it? Maybe. It's Come real on. bad. I'm working through only murders in the building. Also, watch the Sandman if you haven't. Everyone, yeah, everyone was saying. Oh yeah, you you tweeted about it, and then you you posted from our account about it, and then Monica Lewinsky retweeted it. I didn't see that one, but Neil Gaiman uh, yes. did. So that was the one I noticed. But yeah, I love Monica Lewinsky. Yeah, Monica Lewinsky. It was just been watching the Sandman. Tossed us the retweet on that. Monica Lewinsky parentheses she her. I wouldn't expect otherwise to be honest, but I don't think you need to clarify. Yeah, tossed, yeah, tossed no, out the retweet uh, I was, on LCD. I, I was shocked Netflix did a good adaptation of something that really not very adaptable, and they kind of nailed it. Um, next week, we are reviewing uh, – I don't know what we're reviewing. That's a lot of streaming stuff next week, I know. Cherry. Um, <laughs> what Cherry. else we got? Um, we'll, do, we'll do something. Isn't yeah. Netflix dropping a movie? You could do Marcel. Well, they're doing uh, Day, Day Shift, Shift with yeah. Jamie Foxx. We can do that. Yeah. Do Bodies, Bodies, Bodies. Yeah, it is going wide this week. It is going wide. You, Shout good. out, by the way. I mean, I'll say it. When movies leak online, after I see them in theaters, I like to pull them back and like scrub through and see some scenes. There's two scenes I want to see from Nope. Nope, still not online. Yeah, they're really under wraps with that. Yeah, yeah they, they've they've done a good job scrubbing that because it's definitely a big enough movie and wide enough where it should be online. So, yeah, I wanted to go back and look at one scene, um, but I actually did see it three times. Remember, I I have I have seen Mrs. Harris goes to Paris. <laughs> Uh, Mrs. Harris goes to Paris is delightful. Uh, it's not anything amazing, but I I, I did like. Oh, we should review uh, yeah. Summer of the Crawdads or whatever that is. Or the oh, Crawdads thing. I did not like that movie. <laughs> Summer um, of the that has a wild gap between audience and critics. Oh One yeah, of the most yeah. books I've like ever that. Seen. Yeah, books. Mm-hmm. B- I mean, it, that's it's a book club. It's a massive book club book. Where Thirteen Lives. That's streaming. Thirteen Lives by Ron oh, Howard. Yeah, that was pretty right. solid. Yeah. Nothing crazy. Like it, it was. It was good. It was. It was actually really good. It was a good Did movie. Did you see the Photoshop picture of uh, Colin um, Colin Farrell for the like the Amazon banner ad? Like they couldn't get him. I guess for the picture. It's no. so fucking funny. And I'll, apparently, Rise of the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles is pretty awesome too. Mm-hmm. If you like Ninja Turtle stuff. Which I do like. I do like the Ninja Turtles. Is that an animated movie? Yeah. Oh. Um, yeah, I, I like the animation of it a lot uh, on the trailer, but I've not watched it yet. Uh, that's it. Uh, for Ken Jack, Chris, Gooch, I'm Jeff D. Lowe. We will talk to you next week.